Okay, thank you. So, Deputy Secretary, you are here today to talk to us about the SLDS. Yes, I am indeed. Okay, great. Yes, we've, we've been wondering about this. We've been hearing a few things about this. Sure. So, reading a few things about it. Reading a few things well. about it as well, yeah. Uh, for the record, uh, Deputy Secretary Heather Boucher, Agency of Education. Uh, thank you, Chair Webb and committee members. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I am indeed here to speak about the statewide longitudinal data system, provide you all with an update. That's what SLDS stands for. I will try to keep the acronyms at a minimum. Today. Or just, just explain them as you go. I, yeah, if I forget, please ask, um, because I think, I think those new to the committee are realizing what um, acronym land really looks like once you delve into education. We might be, we might be the best at that. Um, I do want to um, also introduce uh, Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Digital Services, Sean Naylor, who is here as well. And Brad, what is your official title other than like <laughs> finance guru of the world? Um, uh, the official title is education finance manager. Education finance manager. Um, <laughs> Brad James, who will testify uh, after me about some specifics with respect to um, financial questions that um, I believe may have arisen as a result of the SLDS, um, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, and I will also rely, if it's okay, Madam Chair, with on these two individuals. If we get, I get some specific questions about fiscal details or um, intricate information technology IT details that I'll probably try to answer. But Ms. do you want them to sit with you? Or? Um, I don't. I don't think. So. Okay. Is it okay if, yes. if they're needed? Though I'll call yes. them up. Is that okay? That's fine. Because I think we'll do fine. It's just for added texture and context if yeah. needed. Um, I also wanted to start with a humorous note that I seem to have picked up a cold since I last saw you. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. I will try to keep it, uh, my symptoms over here, Dylan. Mm -hmm. I'd also note that I was just fine until I started coming over to this place, yeah. but <laughs> some of you may be sick as well. I don't know. Okay. So um, here is the most fun slide for my presentation. It's a very technical presentation. Um, I wanted to just... Um, capture you with some bright uh, colors um, to make sure we're all awake. So um, if you're not aware, some of you will already be, we received a federal grant uh, from the U.S. Department of Education back in 2012, which was, um, a, which was the second, um, second um, request for proposals. We actually were unsuccessful in our first request from the feds to actually help state agencies across the uh, nation invest um, more technology and um, build robust capacity, uh, more automaticity in terms of um, how data are collected, managed, and actually reported um, in education state agencies. So it's been um, a long process. Um, we first got that grant in 2012, as you can see. Um, the bulk of the nearly $5 million that we got went toward a project called the Vermont Automated Data, Data Reporting um, Vader project. Um, for some of us, also a note of humor. Um, the acronym means some different things, given that it's Vader, given how long we've been working on this for a long time. So. I'm glad some of you are smiling. Um, Star Wars fans would know what I'm talking about. Um, so, <laughs> so there were several specific deliverables um, that were required um, for uh, meeting the goals of the grant, and I'm happy to say that we have actually met all of these deliverables. So we do have um, a functional vertical <coughs> data collection process. Um, it, is, it has been built. It actually is in operation. Um, we have built um, the operational data store. Um, the capacity for it. We also do have um, tool data loads auto, uh, uh, automated um, for analytics. We have established an enhanced training delivery system. Um, early on, this was a series of uh, wikis and um, webinars for the field to take a, to view and look at. But more recently, as I'll go further into the presentation, because we are delayed, we have done a lot more hands-on. Um, training um, and try to be much more systematic about that in the field during the last, I would say, six months, actually. Um, 
our ed facts submission files, which are the core files that have to get reported um, by all state agencies to the Federal Department of Education, um, are now capable of being automatically generated. Um, mm -hmm. And we um, are not quite done with the growth model reporting tool, but have made significant progress on it. Just a definition. What's an, uh, can you just, in a nutshell, explain what an automatic vertical data collection process I'm going to get into that. Oh, um, so okay. it's, it's all of this, which I know is highly technical. Um, the rest of the presentation is actually going to be in plain English. Okay. No, that's okay. I just wanted to. <laughs> I kind of did it backwards a little bit. Thank and, you so much. But, but, and I'm sorry, I don't have your name. I'm Sarita Austin. Hi. And I lost hi, my name. Representative Austin. Austin. If no, no, I didn't in, lose it. It's under a zipper somewhere. If something isn't clear, though, please stop me. And um, if because if, I def, definitely want to make sure this is clear and in plain English. So um, if after the plain English is shared, if it still doesn't make sense, please let me know. Can you explain the purpose here, the purpose of this, of this change? Yes. Oh, that's coming. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we just be quiet for a minute? <laughs> okay. just, I, I thought about, should I go into the, I just wanted to get the nitty gritty. Like we are actually, we have met our deliverables check. So what I also was going to say, though, that that is, that is technical. So we've met the technical deliverables. Always, with any project, the devil is in the details. And that's what you've been hearing a lot about, and that's what I'm going to talk about okay. a lot more. Um, so there are three components to any system like this, and a lot of IT systems. Um, data collection, data um, arrangement, organization, and then um, data visualization or output. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of those. So that actually is what we're investing in, a system that, when it's done fully, allows us to do those three different things in a much more streamlined, much more systematic, meaning all schools are looking the same in terms of the process, which really hasn't been the case until Which now. allows us to compare and contrast. Well, we always could do some compare and contrast, but it, it was a lot more difficult and more time consuming to actually get the data in the, in the way we needed to to do those comparisons. So when this is actually complete, it allows us to have more kind of like one-click functionality. The challenge is setting it all up to get the one-click functionality has been like where the real um, work has been and why it's taken so long. So the first piece is data, data collection, and that's called vertical reporting um, in the state longitudinal data system. So it's really about, and, and what the vertical piece means is how is each system at the local level getting the required data to the state agency? So all states have to deal with some kind of vertical reporting. The way they actually have set it up might be different. For instance, in some states, which we weren't really ready for as our state, uh, they might have said, we're going to one statewide system. Everyone's going to use, at the local level, the same data collection tool, the same fields, the same um, everything, and it's going into one systematic sort of monolith at the state agency. We weren't ready. I wasn't around. We didn't decide to do that um, in our state for probably very good reasons, I can imagine. And so we hmm. still have... Um, a bit of the Wild West at the local level. So we have a lot of different types of data collection um, products and vendors. And so part of the challenge, as you're going to see, is that we've, we've tried to, what we're doing is actually setting this state agency level unitary new product and trying to talk to all these different kinds of systems that are still out there um, at the local level. How many different systems are you trying to um, there's at least three, but I would probably say five or six because there's a I mean, couple. There, was, there were six. Everyone. There were six. Three, three main. Yep. Yeah. I do know some things. Three main systems, but then a couple. Well, of three main, like Power School, Infinite Campus. Is that one? And. Um, uh, VCAP, but that's more of a. Is that the right? No, that's the, the integrator in between. Okay. The, the, um, <clears throat> Tyler. Tyler. So these are. So can you just state your name for the record? Oh, sorry. Um, for the record. Recognize your voice. Yep, Sean Naylor, Deputy Secretary, ABC Digital Services. Thank you. My bad. Um, so I kind of jumped into that in the second point that um, there have been, you know, there's a variety of local systems. Um, 
local entities made choices based on their um, fiscal situation, their comfort, their trust on which vendors they wanted to go to, long-standing patterns of who they've worked with. Um, one of the pieces, though, that's really critical is there's also a real difference in capacity at the local level. So some, and you're going to see that in the data, so some um, uh, LEAs, local education agencies, were able to pretty quickly jump into this work, and now they've been kind of waiting a while because they were able, they have more capacity, they have perhaps more sophisticated staff that they've been able to hire. Um, they were able to do this pretty quickly, um, move to the new system. Others, um, either, I mean, variety of reasons, employee transition, um, changes in local vendor contracting situation, um, and, you know, maybe having a bit of um, transition around which vendor they were going to use. Not everyone stayed with the same vendor. Um, cost has been an issue um, for some. Um, those are the reasons, in some sense, where we are today, because what's, so the system itself is built but what's the problem right now is we're still waiting for some of the data to come in. So just to put that kind of in a nutshell. And we're very close, and I think that's actually um, something that we're, we're pretty excited about because we've really put in a lot of effort during the past couple of months to make sure that we can finally um, get this over the finish line. Um, so just to reiterate, what we're talking about is everyone, the state, including state employees, was adopting a new system, new product, system with HMH, um, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Some of you might remember that used to be a textbook publishing company, and now it's, well, parts of it did. Now it's actually in um, IT space, as are Pearson and some others. Um, we also, because of our S estate plan, have moved to reporting at the district or SU level, and that was different. That's different, and that's created some strain at the local level, and that was required as a function of our ESSA plan. Um, so it used to be that schools could just directly upload data. They were flat files. It was a very old sort of fashion system. But um, having it now have to go through that district level has created a bit of just transition and challenge um, for some folks to actually um, get on the same page. So they might have to make sure, for instance, if their business managers were doing this work, that all the business managers are on the same page. Um, some, in some SUs, it was a business manager in one school and a data, um, a education technology individual in another school. And so they've had to, to do a lot of um, integration, such as that, with, with staffing. Um, and then the bottom line is there has been, um, and was needed, a significant level of coordination and then frontline training. Um, for both schools and um, our state staff, as I mentioned. So um, in, in sum, that's kind of giving you a sense of what it is, and this is the piece that the bulk of the work has been on um, because we um, did not have a vertical reporting system that passed muster uh, with the feds, which is why we actually got the grant. Um, so again, just to reiterate, this is actually, I mean, we, are, we literally have a handful <coughs> of schools that are actually uh, working today, right now, to actually get this data up. And then we'll need a little bit more time to do the next piece, which is the data arranging and organizing. Um, but we are very confident that um, in the spring we will have the report card, we will have the schools identified, and all that kind of stuff so done. So the original data was supposed to be available, the report card. Was fall. Supposed to, it was supposed to be this fall, mm -hmm. they're available, but they, you're saying that they will be available in the spring. Yes. And we're okay with the feds on that? We are. Um, we do, so just to be clear about that, so we <coughs> did miss our state deadline that was in our state plan because it was fall. 2018. But the federal government has not, the federal USDOE has not taken a hard stance on that. In fact, um, it actually, uh, there was no deadline imposed in the actual statute, the ESSA statute. Um, the the sorry, reason, again. there was no deadline imposed in the federal statute. So this was just an agreement between the It was an agreement, yeah. and even more specifically, um, what had happened is, in the previous uh, presidential administration under Obama, the rules and regulations from the U.S. Department of Education had specified by December, yeah. and so we, we went with that um, by fall. We wanted to have it a little bit in a little bit earlier. But all of those rules and regulations were actually uh, rescinded, um, 
with the um, committee because they felt that not this particular piece, but lots of the other rules and regulations were an overreach by the yeah, U.S. DO, DOE. Is yes. So what it so what stands now is the statute, the committee, Lamar Alexander's committee on education. Um, they said that there had been an overreach um, in terms of the rules and regulations by the U.S. Department of Education. So they said, kind of back to the drawing board. We're not going to we're not going to hold states accountable. The actual committee that wrote the bill and that actually the bill came from. We're not going to hold the states accountable for the specifics of those rules and regulations. We are held accountable though for what's in the actual federal statute, and that's what I'm saying. There isn't a particular deadline. Does that mean that we're thrilled and happy? No, we want to get this done, and so I, I'm here to actually assure the committee that we're working as hard as we can. We're not thrilled that we're late. Um, it's, there's a lot of reasons, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but again, I, I am, we are very confident that um, this will be, uh, the SLDS and the data will actually be complete and the identifications for uh, federal purposes for um, title um, allocations and for um, the school uh, state report card will definitely be finished in the spring. Um, so, the second piece, um, sort of if you think about this, it's kind of like data comes in, in the middle, there's all this data arranging and querying and matching data together across different types of files, matching student level data with school level data and district level data. Um, there's, uh, autom like there's, there's some verification of the data. So for instance, um, what we're talking about right now with the vertical reporting is making sure that the system actually runs. So our, you know, was the data that was put in actually, like will the system actually accept it? Now comes a piece which is, and again, um, we've already built this into the new calculation, the new estimate for spring. Now comes um, staff at the agency saying like, okay, reaching back out to the schools as an example, reaching out to the district. Did you really mean to say that none of your seniors graduated last year? Because that's what your data shows. So other states, I will say, do not do this step. California, they say, it's on you. We don't have the capacity. Like, what you put in is what you get. We have been a kinder, gentler state and have built this in. And I, and I do think um, as we move forward, we want to probably continue talking about that because it is, it is a lot of um, wasted resources, quite frankly. And so we have a goal of um, helping the, the um, local education agencies um, do a better job of actually getting accurate. So how's a mistake like that happen? Yeah. Um, human error, usually. Human error. Is it the newness of the system? No, no. This has been something that's been going on since the advent of <laughs> technology and data. Um, other examples might be um, a student is, I don't know, uh, miscoded. I was going to pick gender, but that's not really a good example, um, just given that we have a lot of fluidity around gender um, now in our student population. But something that um, is a pretty permanent marker, such as, let's say, age. So um, we, we, we collect age, and if in some file it says they're 10 and everything else says they're 12, there's a problem there. And so that's the kind of thing which would be, we think that this kid is 12, but can you correct that for us? Because the other point is, we really can't, we can't do this data for the schools. That would be not okay. Like it has to come from them. Like we can't correct that data for them. Everyone understands why, right? Like it has to be their data that's then certified. Okay, any other questions about that stuff. That is, is also going to be like a very automatic process. We are actually contracting with a new entity, C2, that will actually um, build a much more robust platform form using SQL Server that will allow that middle management of the data, if you will, to be a much more um, automatic type of process. It's not currently there right now. So you're looking at one vendor? There's a variety of vendors. There's one vendor for the actual SLDS system. Yeah. So um, we, but there's, a, and this is where Sean can help me out, um, Deputy Secretary Naylor. So this C2 is 
actually helping the agency boost its sort of regular operating infrastructure by investing in SQL, another kind of IT product that will allow, um, Sean, maybe you can speak to this, but my understanding is it will allow much more um, simple automated types of um, prepping of the data and then therefore analytics to be done. Yeah. Uh, Sean Yeller again, uh, BDS. So what we have worked with the Agency of Education on is to bring in um, almost like a parallel in-house environment that works, that gives more robust tools uh, to AOE staff to be able to do the data management and manipulation that needs to go on for things like suppression and um, normalization of the data, validation, um, and it also is going to allow for other disparate data that may not be directly related to what's being captured. If down the road there's a desire to do comparison reporting and stuff, this environment will allow that. So um, it's built on normal Microsoft technology. I know I'm geeking out, so I apologize. Uh, but it's just... We it, understand Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a base, what they call relational database management system. So it's just... It's the, it's the enterprise container that allows data to go in and manipulations and rearranging to happen uh, in a way that is more sustainable uh, for that work that needs to happen outside of the SLDS. And where we've engaged is with uh, the company C2 out of uh, the Burlington area that is helping with coming in and ramping up both AOE and ADS staff that is in the education agency to be able to not only build this out themselves, but build upon it and maintain it moving forward. What he said, see, I know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm just wondering what resources and uh, training uh, school districts have to, to guarantee the validity of the data they're entering. Um, I actually have brought a handout and it's in my bag. So um, we have provided a series of workshops, um, get togethers, um, phone calls, like actually ho on the phone, like for many hours, like work <laughs> working with folks to continue to do that. Um, the vendors themselves, so those local vendors that they've contracted with, are all, they also have the specs. So they're supposed to be able to, you know, most of them are able to actually work with um, the um, local staff to, to get what they need. But again, given some of those capacity issues, we have had to really help out um, at the agency level. Capacity um, at the local level. Yes, it, yes. And um, then, of course, doing that work um, has had an impact on the capacity of the agency. So, for instance, as I think you know, some of our reports are somewhat delayed because we've got the same people working on data for the reports as, as doing this work. Um, so, um, and, and that will continue. So, um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about sort of like what the impact of that um, help has been so far, um, which I'm pretty pleased about. And then the data visualization piece really has to do with um, what I think folks here, the committee is most interested in, at least not for, not for this kind of conversation, but for, for the typical conversations we have in terms of making policy decisions. So um, what do the data actually tell us? What are the, you know, how do we interpret um, what is going on? How do we organize it visually to understand it better? What patterns can we detect? What we're doing now, as you might have heard about, is the state report card, also um, funded through uh, the ESSA um, uh, allotment and um, required by ESSA legislation. And um, I also have some handouts on that as well. Um, I'm happy to come back and do a presentation if you all would like on um, ESSA and the snapshot, but it's, there's just not enough time to go into it today. But that, if you, can, if you can think of it as like, that's the pretty part of data that actually shows you um, in lay person's terms, like what is actually going on with our data. So I'm kind of jumping around from nitty gritty to middle to voila, which is what I think we're all most excited about is, is that last piece. Any questions on that? so far. Um, so I did mention um, that there have been some delays. We want to be quite open and <coughs> honest about that. Um, there, there has been a rollout um, in this final push. Um, we are now sort of in this, um, you know, 
moving definitely across the finish line um, because there has been a delay in the past year. Um, we did have some challenges with um, the contract with the one entity that designed the SLDS. Um, as I said, their, their um, HMH, which is this big monolith um, organization company, uh, for-profit company, and at points they were kind of like, eh, we're not sure, and, and we actually, um, we're not sure we want to continue to do the work, but we worked with them and they, they continue to. This happens a fair amount for us because we're such a small state and it happens, and I mean, you can probably speak to this, Sean. Um, sometimes when we want to have the very best, which we deserve, we will, you know, we get the very best, but sometimes, I mean, there's often a lot of transition in the IT space um, in terms of these products, and sometimes when there has been a transition, um, leadership of those companies will be like, why do we want to, you know, maybe we should just, you know, cut our losses and pull out because we're not, we're doing all this work for this teeny little contract for them, which is a huge contract for us, but it's a teeny little contract. So, so my understanding was you had a vendor, but that vendor was bought by another vendor? Yes. That, right? So yes. all of a sudden... So there was some... You had a multi-billion dollar corporation that was dealing with a little... Yes. But we worked it out. Yeah. Um, but, but that did create some delay. Um, and some momentary panic, um, because it was really, you know, we were wondering what the heck we would do. When did that happen? Uh, I think two years ago. Do you recall? Yeah, but that was part of my mind, but it was It was when Secretary Holcomb was um, um, managing the agency. But I'm pretty sure it was two years ago. It wasn't in the last year that um, she was there. Um, there was some co uh, delay with vendor contracts um, in terms of uh, ensuring that, again, these local vendors would actually be set up to um, help do the work. There were some delays there. They've now um, been uh, squared away. Um, there were some delays in getting the specs out to the field. Um, I think because of the delay in vendor contracts, some of this actually is um, a domino effect. And then the other piece, which I did want to make sure I bring to the committee's attention, is we have had, and, and certainly Deputy Naylor is uh, very aware of, we have had, um, for reasons that were really not in a lot of our control, multiple IT systems that had to actually be renewed, updated, uh, transformed at the same time. A grants management system that had the previous product was actually, like, going out of business and there was going to be no more support for it, as I understand. Um, the, what's the acronym for the SS chart of accounts? SSDMS. SSDMS, did I get it right? Two S's, two S's, two D's. SSDDMS, I don't know if I have it right, but it's the uniform chart of accounts um, that I think was um, needed and then also supported um, here by the legislature. Um, I know I'm forgetting another one that was a pretty, and these are big asks on the same local entities that are trying to work on the SLDS, so that's actually why I'm talking about this. The chart of account is, is under the same? Yes, so, so in many places, for instance, the business manager would be working with others to actually, in the old system, it would have been the business manager or someone in the business manager's team, like if there were a registrar, for instance, that was actually uploading the data. Again, now because we're moving, to, we've moved to an SU um, data collection system. They are involved, but not. You know, it, it, there was some transition there, but they're <coughs> definitely involved in the um, unified, uniform chart of accounts. Keep what should explain the chart of accounts? Um, so, chart of accounts is a systematic way to uh, track um, through through uniform codes track what um, dollars are being spent on. So, um, and here's where um, Brad, James, could perhaps jump in. But my understanding is, um, much as we have had in some of the other conversation pieces I've brought up, we have had a history of very different types of financial reports coming in or different categories, meaning different things um, across schools and across districts. And so this is a way to say, Everyone's on the same page, so we know what the personnel line means for everyone, just as a very broad example. Um, and I don't know if there's some other examples, Brad, that you want to actually no, point no. out. And I'm sure I'm butchering I'm this. James Agency Education, for the record. Um, you're, you're, you've got the general gist of it correct. There were a number of systems out there that didn't talk to each other. They all had to report to us. 
um, business managers wanted to have something more that was a, a common thing. There's still going to be differences because they're still going to interpret things differently, but it's going to be much better than it had been in the past once it's all organized and straightened out. And it will allow. Where are we, where are we in timing with that? The uniform chart of accounts. Um, it, it should, it should, it's, it's being implemented right now by some districts. Um, it's kind of a stage process, the way it's set up, along with the financial management system that Ted was talking about, the, the SSD DMS. Um, it's, it's being f phased in. I think there is a number that are supposed to go live July 1, and then there are others who are going to go probably, I would say, maybe within a year after, after July 1. I'm not sure what the exact final date is, yeah. but it's... How many do you think will be ready by, by July 1? I think there are 40 in there. Um, I don't think they'll all be ready by July 1, and that's, that's something the conversations we're having in the background. Is that 40 out of? 40 out of the currently now we're at 53 mm -hmm. SUs. Um, we've had two or three go live already, another one. I think, I think two are live already, two are about to go live, and then we've got the, the next big block. A lot of them went for, because they're getting unlimited support from the provider, Power School. Okay. Just to follow up, if you don't mind. Um, uh, and the, the uniform chart of account effort is wholly separate from the SLDS. Yes. In future, the plan is that they could talk better to each other, but that's not part of, I believe, that's not part of the work plan right now because we first got to get the, these kind of substrates nailed down, the actual products themselves. So I already talked about this, but um, the result of this is that we, we had an initial deadline of fall 2018 and now we're looking at um, sometime this spring. Um, I just want to uh, end my, my formal testimony by giving you um, a snapshot of what this has looked like. And I've mentioned um, a couple of times the hard work of our core staff. Um, they have been, frankly, I've never seen such an incredibly hardworking staff in my entire career. Um, they have been putting in tons of overtime. Um, foregoing vacation around the holidays, um, things that, you know, kind of break my heart, but that's how committed they are to doing this. So when, when we started um, looking at, okay, we're not actually meeting the deadline that we need, um, we started actually getting daily updates on what was happening at, again, this, these, are, these are numbers of districts. And so as you can see in that first column, well, as you can see on the top row, this is tracking the number of districts that had not submitted anything to the SLDS. The number who had submitted, but there were errors, um, and again, this is errors in the SLDS, so it wasn't running properly. Um, and then those that were certified or ready to be certified. Ready to be certified means that someone on the LEA, it's all been cleared by the agency, someone on the LEA just needs literally, again, to press a button and say, boom, we're done. So we count that as pretty much ready. Yeah, I just want to, we often go around talking about SUs, this says districts. It's both. So it's, well, it, if, if I may, it, please it's, 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 it's really at the supervisory union level. Okay, yes. but what, what, part, what causes part of the confusion is there's supervisory districts, which right. are a subset. It's, I, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, but when we're saying districts, we're so talking about. What we don't have is, is, is a, we don't have East Montpelier Elementary Correct. School as a district. You, you have Washington yeah. Central, Correct. which is what I was referring to. So these are the operating districts or operating SUs, which I think is a clarification. Thank you for forcing me to remember that all the time, Representative Conner. <clears throat> Um, so as you can see, um, we had um, a substantial amount back in um, November that had not submitted. Um, we had a, a chunk that were um, uh, had that the the state agency and the vendor had noted errors, and so that um, automatically leads to a system of communications back and forth with the LEA um, to actually st you know, fix that, go back, and and resubmit. And then as you can see, we did have some who were, who were ready. And I think that's actually um, important to point out as well, um, that we did have some, I mentioned this earlier, that some of the systems that had more robust capacity were able to, like this was pretty easy for them. They were able to use the guidance that was provided and, um, and um, get that done. Does this tend to be the larger districts? You know, it's been interesting. We thought that when I went and looked at it, but no. Part of it has been, again, those local decisions about what they were doing with vendors. So for instance, a couple of them were our larger systems that were actually struggling because they had decided for a variety of reasons um, that they were going to like go with a new vendor for like a transition period. 
and then go back to a different vendor, like for um, for uh, uh, spring, for instance, spring census, and then they had a different one for fall. I know that there's one, for instance, um, that they would have a different one for the fall and the tuition census. By the way, I've mapped these out on the um, left-hand column. These are the different data collection. Um, we call them data collection. So it's a it's a group of particular types of information that are required um, either by federal or um, by state law um, to be collected at these times. So they're very time bound. So the end of year, formerly called the spring census, we're still collecting data on that and that's from last spring. Um, the reason that one's critical is because that is what informs much of the state report card and much of the identification um, issues that are actually um, delayed, as I talked about. Um, it's also, the reason it's taken so long, even though it's kind of like the first data, is because it has a much bigger number of data files. It has a, it, it's a bigger data collection. And so because of that, there have been, there's been more opportunity for errors, those kinds of things. So even though um, chronologically, it actually makes sense that it would be completed the first, um, it, it was a, it's more difficult. And because it was started first, it actually allowed, we believe, the tuition student census and the ADM census to be actually completed a little bit more um, quickly because they got kind of a taste, even though it might not have been fully resolved, they were still working on the spring. They got a taste of what the system looked like and they were able with a, with a uh, more um, simple um, set of data collection uh, requirements to kind of like pop up those others. So um, the thing that I'm really excited about is so as of the 23rd, um, everyone has submitted, um, every single um, operating district or SU has submitted their data. I'm looking at this, where is that? You say everybody has submitted? So there are zero under not submitted now. Okay. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I need a Oh, we're at, we're point at today. Out. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and then, can I just finish this one piece and then oh, yeah, question? Oh, yeah, yeah. And we've now um, significantly, and I could have, if you're interested, I can give you all the, you know, intermediate details. I'm just trying to go from point A to point B. We've now also really um, hammered away at these errors. And as you can see, we're very strong in terms of who's done. So we, we really, like for that spring census, we have, I believe it's now um, nine that are actually working on um, really getting the errors. And those are the systems that they're really getting a handhold from our core staff, daily connection, like how's it going, can I help you, that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I really, and then for the other two, there's just one SU. They happen to be different, um, but they're, each of them, there's just one. And you know, I'm, it might even be by Monday that those are done. And um, you know, so, so we really do feel, as I said, very confident given this, that we will, we will be just fine in the spring. Representative Elder. I was just curious, why are there 57 districts in the top lines and 53 in the others? A little it, thing called Act 46. Yeah, I was wondering. It just, it just <laughs> was surprising to me that we're going up in districts as the dates get later. I would have thought that it would have gone the other. So we've got, on one of these, it seemed like the, maybe I've got a, it, anyway, can you explain yeah. that? Yeah, this, this is spring last year. Oh, it's spring, okay, so that's spring across. before the fall. So right, it's 57. Yeah. Got it, okay. These last two were from this fall, mm -hmm. um, and so those are 53. Okay. So we've shrunk. We, we've as the supervised unions have been shrinking a little bit. Right. And 53 is the number now, is that right? As of this year, yeah. As of this year, there will yeah. be some others. It will be 52 at least next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Representative Ask, did you have a question? No, no. not yet. <laughs> I will. <laughs> we can count on it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, thank you. Oh, we're in question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering about, um, do you have capacity to see this through? Do you have the state dollars to see this through? Where are we in terms of, of resources? Yeah, I, I think, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have um, formed a, a very strong partnership with leadership at the Agency of Digital Services. We've invested in um, some additional project management resources. Um, and so I don't, I don't think we're 
in dire straits fiscally. Um, and I think, again, we really are in that final push. So I think um, we're okay. Um, I think we have augmented uh, staff as we've needed to and haven't actually had to come back to the legislature uh, for significant for additional resources fiscally on that. Um, as you know, the, the amount of time it can take to actually hire a new person um, we, is, is tough. Particularly, I mean, we were talking to you a couple of days ago, Secretary French and I, about the, the skilled workforce. And this is a quite skilled um, project. It requires significant um, skill. Interestingly, we actually have um, one of the things I'm really proud of. This has been a really hard slog. And we have, there has been no turnover in this team in the agency, which I cannot say for some of the other programmatic teams in the past couple of years. So, so this team, the data team, is, is stable? Oh, marvelously stable. They consider themselves a family. They're, they're pretty amazing. I don't know. Would you agree? <laughs> I'm sure you do not agree. <laughs> you can't not agree with that, Ms. Frank. Right? We'll get um, you off the record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did not do that to you. We, we know how valuable you are. He, he is an extremely valuable member of this mm -hmm. team. Um, questions? Representative Cotton. Uh, so, you know, what we sort of hear, what we hear locally, um, the issue is uh, equalized pupils. This falls into that. Brad and I chatted a little bit about this earlier. And uh, so if we are lacking just one school district to get their information correct, um, where are we on equalized pupils, number one? And number two, uh, if we were having so much trouble getting equalized pupil numbers out, this year, was it, do we have the same situation last year? And if not, why didn't we just sort of go back and use last year's method and, and kind of get it? So it was time. three questions. But I also think that's, um, if I may, well, more tell me the story about well, it. Well, that's a <laughs> perfect segue, Representative Conlon, to why Brad is here. <laughs> Um, I believe that's the microphone's a little bit better. Yes, what? And I'm here if there yeah. are additional questions. About this. <laughs> yeah. We will switch. Yeah. Yeah, switch a room. Okay. Again, Brad James, Agency of Education, officially at the chair now. Um, hot seat, we like to call it. Hot seat, yeah. yes. The throne, I like to Not yet. I don't know you guys well enough. Some of you I do. Um, so, all right, let's, let's where are we? Um, Secretary, so Deputy Secretary Boucher showed that there were 52 SU's in for this, both the fall, the fall student, public student census and the tuition census. Both those drive equalized pupils. There's one that still work on errors. Actually, quite a few are actually working on errors because what happens is once they're certified, I see the data, I send it back out to people, and they go, uh-oh, that's not right. We're missing X number of students here. I don't see these people here. So this is still an impro and, and it's still working. It looks like on, on the gross numbers of by certification, it does look like we're close to being. We are getting close, far closer than we have been in the past, as, as, as was said. Um, but we're not there yet. I sent out version eight of equalized pupils yesterday. <laughs> I heard there was a version nine. Well, I, I, I think I, I think two two cycles ago I saw version nine thousand three hundred and twenty one. <laughs> I think that's what I called it, um, but it's really version six or seven. Um, but I sent out version eight yesterday. There will be a version nine, unquestionably. Um, and as I was looking at the data, I saw that most everybody's in because we've been missing two two supervisory units for quite some time. They're both in at this point, so people are seeing their data now as it has been submitted and they're working on it. But there's still a tremendous number of errors between what I saw in version seven and what I saw in version eight in terms of just the ADM counts, this the numbers that we're talking about here. Um, so th they're they're working, they're seeing it, but we're getting to the point now where I'm going to I think I'm going to say okay. Two weeks from today, hard stop, we're done. Okay, so that means everybody needs to look at their numbers right now. You need to look at all the problems, all the issues in there. You need to talk to your IT people because it's the business managers and it's the registrars who know the kids. It's not the IT people. And that's, that's, that's where there's a bit of a disconnect. Um, it's, it's getting resolved. I don't think we'll have this issue next year. 
or if we do it, certainly won't be to the same degree by any means, because um, people are working things out. But at this at this point, I think I'm getting to the point where I'm going to say, okay, we're, we're, I'm going to freeze it here because everybody has now been in. You can all see what we've got, and so you need to work now. You need to be talking to your people. People keep asking, what do we do? I said, call the support desk. <laughs> I don't know the answer, but you know they're 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 working their way towards that. So I think that's where we are. Last year we were using a different system. It was the old system. It kind of fell apart, and we we stopped. We didn't run them in parallel. Um, and we just went to this new one. It, it, obviously, there are problems with it. The, the rollout was not smooth. We had, we, as again, as I said, we had different people running, pulling data out of, out of supervisor union information systems, but they don't know the data. They don't know what's missing. They don't know what needs to be included. Um, some people did not realize that there were two censuses that needed to be input for the fall. So it, it, it's, it's been, it's been an, an iterative process here trying to get people up to speed. <laughs> it's, it's not like people are not working, though. I, I know what people have been doing. Some some districts were a little bit slack. Others were not. Um, very few were slack. Um, so we're we're making progress. But again, as I said, we're getting there. <coughs> so if you say in two weeks, then that will be a hard stop. I think this, so. This will be your number. Yep. That, that's that's what I'm looking at right now, based on what I saw yesterday. Okay. And so I, so I mean, I'll still be giving them information, but it, but at some point we have to stop. Um, and, and again, uh, what, I, what, what I've sent out, that, we want to talk about equalized people's how it all works. There's a whole harmless provision in it from the prior year. Right, okay, so, so that whole harmless is, is it's, still... It, it, there, it's, it's a different whole harmless than it used to be. Okay, can you explain what the whole harmless sure. is? Sure. Um, you've all probably heard of phantom students at some point, just, cause, <laughs> just because. Um, so when... The, the way the law used to read was that you could not, a district could not have fewer than, than 96.5% in order to drop 3.5% from the prior year's count. The prior year's count was a whole harmless count. So if in year one, the cur current year, a district had 100 kids, then I said, okay, you've got 100 kids. If next year I did the calculation and they had 90 kids, then I can only drop them by 3.5%. So they would have 96.5% is what it would appear. That difference between the 90 and the 96 and a half, six and a half, those are the phantoms. That's the whole harmless. What the law used to say then was in the second, third year, whichever year we're on, next year out, if I calculated there were 80, I went three and a half percent from the prior year's 96.5. So, so what happened was there's become a tail growing. So the in that one district, I think, that had more phantom it, students than actual students. It was about 50 percent of them, maybe 52 percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there, there was, and, and was a scary place. It, and the, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, the, the halls, the halls. <laughs> um, but the, I, it, that led to all kinds of problems. That I won't go into those. Um, but uh, w the law got changed by Act 46 back in 2015, and there was a little bit of transition period. But now, what's happening is. Using the same example, 100 year one, 90 year two, they got 96 and a half. In year three, if they're at 80, I don't start at the 96 and a half, which was the whole harmless number. I start with the last year's actual count of 90. So I drop that by three and a half percent. So there is still hold harmless, but there's no buildup of a tail. It's an annual thing. Okay. Um, I lost what made me start that, except that you said what's hold harmless. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's so, a very helpful So hold answer. harmless, we, we, if we only have one more year with that? No, no, it, it's, it's ongoing. ongoing. Okay. Districts that have chosen not to voluntarily merge do lose it, yeah. uh, that were not okay by the board. Um, they will lose it. So, we'll, you know, so they, they, I think, I think it happens in 21, so I think it is one more year at this point. So um, at, at this point, we have more phantoms than we should right now because, because the EDM numbers are still not where I think they should be. So this affects, so if you have a district of 1,000 students and you lose three students, that's not that big a deal. But if you, you have, have 20 students. If you have 20 students, or 16. <laughs> okay, yeah, there are a few of those. You know. <laughs> and you lose three students, it, it is a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. And I did lose what started us off on the whole house. Yes, I apologize. Sorry, what we were talking yeah, about, whole we were talking about um, <laughs> the new system rollout. We were talking about that you had gotten to version 8. Yeah. And the question is, how? what's the flip? How, how I've heard from some folks that the change between, say, version 5 and version 6 
was really large. Yes, it was. Um, I, I didn't bring the numbers with me, but yeah. but when when we ran the first equalized people, the first ADM count that turns into equalized pupils, um, there were sixty two thousand ADM reported. I was expecting about eighty six to eighty seven thousand. Excuse me. So there's I, I was expecting about eighty six to eighty seven thousand for for this current year. Okay. That's, I don't know what the number is going to be, but I expect something around there. And you said your first one came in at 62,000. Okay, it's been, it's been growing. The last one that I did yesterday was at 83,000, so we're, we're close. And I do remember what, what started with the whole okay, farmer's part. When, what, I've, I've sent out eight different versions of this so far. There will be more, but I've sent out eight different versions of this so far. I don't know what the right number is supposed to be for districts, okay, because when when you saw that they were certified up here or ready for, well, we didn't show ready for certification, when you saw they were certified up here, um, I get the data. If if they if they see an error in their data, and that what happens to happen is they decertify. I don't see their data anymore. When I, when the data pulled, their data are out. So what happens is their numbers can fluctuate, but. The, the business managers have an idea of roughly what they are, and if their if their district has been identified as receiving hold harmless, which which I show them on whatever I send out, they know that their number will not be lower than that. So they they, they know what their lowest number can be, and so they, they have a better idea what their actual number will be based on what they've seen before. So they, the business managers have a reasonable idea of what they should be seeing at, at this point. And again, their numbers can't get any lower than some of the numbers they've seen in a lot of cases. They identified as whole harmless counts. That's what the whole harmless connection was. So then in two weeks, everybody will know what, their, what the, that, that's what what the per thinking. group people count is that they will be using. That's what, I, that's what I'm thinking, yes. And the, and the per group count, for those of you who don't know, because again, we haven't really talked about any of this. The we per group count is, with Mark, so. yeah, I, I know you did. Yeah, I, I heard him. Yeah. But uh, the per people amount really drives the tax rate, is what it does for the homesteads. School boards are paying attention That's to. That's right. Yeah. That's what you're paying attention to. So, and this gives them enough time. I, I'm not sure what the timing is in terms of warning. Uh, I think most of the warnings are done. Yeah, most are done at this point. So they have to go with the last best number. So yeah. they went with yeah. what, what version were they going with? Well, that, that's what they, they, they could, I mean, again, they probably went in and said, well, I know that we were changing things here because we were higher at this point, and I know right. that we're, and so, but your, our data was out, so they're probably picking the best number that they think out of the eight yeah. <laughs> that they've seen. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good system this year, but it is what it is. And the problem is going to be falling more on the smaller districts. Than yeah, except again, they, they do know what their minimum number will be. If, if nothing, if, you know, worst case scenario. Um, so so if, if their number comes in higher, that is actually good for them. And then those receiving small schools grants, that was another thing that was an issue? Mm -hmm. um, that that had to do with the state board set up criteria for the small schools grants. Yeah. Um, they they on the excellent uh, what was it Ac uh, academic excellence and operational efficiencies. That was one one method of looking at who was eligible or um, distance and travel conditions. What the, what the board did with the operational efficiencies and the, the academic excellence is they came up with criteria that they wanted to use over a period of three years. They lumped them into four broad categories, and then we took kind of took an average of that and added up the, added, added the points from those categories. Um, when I sat down and looked at what they had done and talked to our data people, they said we don't have three years worth of data of a lot of things. We will eventually, but some of these are new, and this is the first year. Some of these were based on something we had. It was a trial. We said we're not going to use these data for anything. We went back to the state board a week ago yesterday and said, so here's what we did in the summer. We used one year's worth of data to, to get this. We've updated it with, with the minor changes that came in. These are the schools that, that meet your, your um, operational efficiencies and academic excellence ideas or criteria, and these are the ones that don't. And the ones that don't can look at geographic considerations <coughs> later on. So the end result of all that is that, that of the I think there were 35, 37, I think there were 37 schools that were eligible for a small schools grant. Of those 37, I think all but three, oh actually all but four made the operational efficiencies criteria and the academic excellence. They got eight out of 16, I think it was. 
Um, three, four of them were low. One of those four was Canaan, which is geog unquestionably geographically isolated. And so they're, they're in with that. I'm not sure what's happened with the other three. Again, we just let them know. So people now know what, what they are. We don't know what the numbers are because I don't know the enrollment yet because we don't have finalized data here. But they do. And I sent out a file that says, plug in your enrollment. It's K-12 enrollment. Plug that in, or K-whatever K you are enrollment. And that will calculate what your grant should be. It'll be within a close range of that. What's the range of the grant sums there? Um, some of them are fairly small, maybe a couple thousand dollars, but some of them are fairly substantial, like one hundred twenty, hundred thirty thousand dollars. I'm not sure what the maximum is, but it, it's it's in that range. Maybe maybe even higher than that. I think, in fact, I think it might be hundred fifty thousand for this current year we're in. And that's that's a significant amount of money. Right. Who are the three that that? Uh, I think you're going to ask me. <laughs> Pe that's right. I think I think I, I think I believe I remember. Peachum, <laughs> Peachum was one. Um, Bakersfield was another one, and then I believe the third one was Holland, but I believe Holland voted to close their school, I think. I've heard that anecdote, I haven't seen anything official. Um, and then, again, as I said, Canaan didn't, but I know Canaan definitely gets it due to the geographic okay. situation. So then Peachum and, and Bakersfield Pe are at risk of losing their yes. school. Yes. They don't meet the criteria. That's right. It's, it's, it's a question of do they meet the geographic criteria, and I'm not certain they do. And, and Peachum was not part of a, a merger. It was not part of a merger. And, and Bakersfield? Bakersfield was. Yeah. Bakersfield merged with Berkshire. Yeah. Um, except it was too small. It was just two small school districts with not enough population to get the incentives. Yeah. Um, so, so they're not when when you were when you got the incentives because of your size and the merger that, that happened. Then, then any small school grants you had among those districts became a merger support grant, right. and it goes on in perpetuity. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it makes me shake a little bit, um, but but it, it go, the, the the merger support grants go on in perpetuity. Um, Bakersfield and Berkshire and Bakersfield's one getting the grant was too small for that. They did not get it. Um, Windsor and West Windsor merged. They also were too small, but West Windsor qualified to, to get to get their grant. Okay, so then in two weeks. This is going to be done. I'm, I'm hoping. Everybody's going to be happy. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> They're rarely happy with what I put out. <laughs> Questions? You're confident that these data discrepancies won't exist next, next, next year? I'm reasonably confident. I'm not confident confident. <laughs> um, I, I think I think what's happening is that, that everybody's realized what's going on. I think there's going to be work in the background on our side. Where they're working, making the system start, you know, the, out, the systems in the field start talking to our system a little bit more directly mm -hmm. or, or better in a more more of a logical fashion. I think people have run through all the errors they could possibly come up with at this point. I think there are going to be a lot of lessons learned. I think what we will do um, is we'll have an once it's all said and done, we'll say, okay, here's what did, what was it that on our side that was not working. What can we do better? And we'll, be, we'll be looking at that, and I'll be talking to business manager and saying, what did you see that wasn't working? You know, we'll, we'll, so we'll, there'll be there'll be a lot of back and forth trying to figure out what's going. on. I don't think it will be anywhere near. We'll, there'll probably be issues because there are always issues in any data collection, especially when it comes to students, because they will forget to put in grades sometimes. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think I think it will be significantly better than it, is, mm -hmm. than it has been this year. So you still be able to catch those mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, we basically, again, this is kind of what um, Heather was saying, or Deputy Secretary Boucher, I'm going to call you Heather. It's so much easier. Um, I'm not a real formal person, in case anybody did that. Um, right? Uh, um, Which is a real problem for me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, no, I just lost my train. Well, <laughs> you, you won't yeah. be doing nine rounds. No, we're, 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 we're basically in, in the background on the data side, on the student data side, our folks are, are doing 
comparisons. They're, they're looking to make sure that only one school district is counting the student. Or if they are, that they split between the two. They're looking for unduplicated students. They're looking. They're looking for students who, you know, just, it's just something's not making sense. And but it's hard to do that until we have all the data in. And that, but that, but we're getting to the point where we're starting that process. There's early columns that we have to look at. There, there are like four or five different things that have to be looked at. So the the folk, our, our people in the background, once they get the data, do look. Um, and, and that's where we'll see, oh, wait a minute, your number, you know, or I'll see it, you know, you're, you're missing a whole grade. That hasn't happened for years, but I do remember once there was, there were three, three or four grades missing in front of school just going, what? <laughs> um, so, you know, they're, they're just human oversights, but, but, I, but the data are checked, they are reviewed by us, we do send it back out to them so they can see it. And, th and that, that's, a, that's a significant check right there. We're hearing the SLDS will be ready this spring? What are the chances that that's accurate? I don't know because I do not work directly with the SLDS. I would turn that over to those two. I just, I, I am an LDS user in that yeah. I hear it from the business managers yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but I'm, just, I'm just a user of data that gets pulled out and handed to me. So it, it, that, that's more question for them. So can I just clarify? Yes. Yeah. The SLDS is, is working itself. Is working. Yeah. It's yeah. functional. It operates as it's supposed to. It's the data. It, it's, it's, it's getting the data. It's the coming in part. So, yeah. so when, uh, a way to phrase this question, I'm sure, when will the data be implemented such that the system is, is working and useful to, that we will be able to get the data from, from it? Well, well the, the, the spring census, I, I, I don't know if there are the data collections that it's being used for or not because again, it's not what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I do know that the spring data collection is the next really major big thing, and that will be at the end of the school year. Uh, the, you know, so we're talking, you know, we're talking, like, talking probably July things when it gets rolled out. Um, may, maybe it's August, it's one of, it's, it's, it's right, but it's basically then. And again, as, as Heather was saying, the spring census is, is significantly more difficult than the two that roll into equalized pupils because it's one from about eight different databases. But people are working their way through that. And again, I think, as, as I was just saying, that I think that there are a lot of lessons that are being learned that people understand, OK, this is what we need to do. And they're, they're looking forward. And, and again, we'll, we'll be talking internally, too. And you have project management with timelines on this. Um, we would appreciate an update. Sure. Maybe sometime in a month. Yeah. Representative Austin, yeah. I need to move on. To yeah, real quickly. Just how does this data inform to make decisions? Just real quickly, the AOE, right, the legislature, school boards? School boards, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The feds. The feds, yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, pretty much everybody. But it's not instruction, it's not it's it's not data on instruct on assessment. Um, no, that comes in through a different, that's one of what we call third party, um, well it's not third party, but it's, it's a separate data collection that needs to be matched to this though. Okay. Yep. And there, there, there's a lot of matching that goes on in the background. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. You're and, very welcome. And um, we just really send very, we're sending good vibes to your department. <laughs> Keep Thank everybody. You. I'll, I'll pass those on. Brownies, does that help? Beer? Always. <laughs> <laughs> 9 30 in the morning's good. Yeah. <laughs> Coffee. Thank you very much. You're You're welcome. Always appreciate hearing from you. Okay. So now we're going to talk to you. Yeah, and we are back. No, I'm good. Uh, before moving to H3 testimony, I did promise um, that I had a couple of handouts. Um, uh, Representative Austin, this is a summary of the training that we've provided for the okay. SLDS. And then this is um, a summary of some of the documents we have on the report card. And I'm embarrassed to say that something happened with our color toner which I didn't realize because the top half looked fantastic. So I should throw them all and whoever gets the nice version. I think they're still legible. Um, I can also send um, electronic copies. And as I said, I'm happy to come back in and talk um, if um, the committee would need or would like a, um, an update or, because uh, I know that there are a lot of new folks um, on the report card and essays. Yeah, I think that's true. I think um, the changing face of education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay.
happy to do that. Um, so shifting gears quite a bit, actually. Um, good morning again, um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today on another um, very important issue um, uh, for our state, um, testimony on H3. Um, I just have a, a pretty simple prepared statement that I'm just going to read, and then of course I'm open for questions as well. Um, the agency certainly appreciates and supports the coalitions and this committee's focus on ensuring equitable learning opportunities and educational experiences for all Vermont students. Indeed, as you heard from Secretary French two days ago, when we jointly testified before you, the primary role of the AOE is to ensure quality and equity across our educational system statewide. So we're supportive of this bill, and we'd like to offer a few additional points for the committee's consideration uh, so as to improve the overall product. Before highlighting these points for your consideration, however, I would like to share with the committee just a few examples of the work that the AOE has undertaken in the context of our shared conversations on initial and current versions of H3. I'm finding myself um, in a bit of a wing flapping, um, excited to share with you what we've been doing um, frame of mind this morning. We've got some really hardworking staff, as I know you know, and so I'm feeling pretty protective of them and wanting to make sure that we're all aware of, of what they're doing. Um, so what we've done in the past several months is, uh, first, as an agency, we defined educational equity. We, we hadn't really been operating um, within uh, the organization under the same sort of shared understanding of what equity was when we were talking about it. We also, and, and that definition, as you can see, is... Uh, meaning that every student has access to the resources, opportunities, and educational rigor that they need at the right moment in their education, whatever their race, their gender or gender identity, their sexual orientation, their ethnicity, religion, language, disability status, family background, or family income may be. And we adapted this from um, CCSSO, and I've done very well with acronyms today. Until um, now. So, yes, so I was just going to say that. CCSSO is the uh, Council for Chief State uh, School Officers. So it is the national organization for um, the secretaries and, and deputies um, that run state agencies or deputy uh, commissioners and commissioners across um, <clears throat> the country. And they do a lot of work trying to ensure uh, consistency across state agencies. And so they have... Um, recently, in the past year, um, really been taking a strong lead in a national conversation on what equity looks like and why it's important. As you might imagine, um, when you look at different states across the nation, um, there, it, equity looks different um, in terms of the student population and how it's framed or, or what's done about it looks quite different as well um, from a state perspective. We've also developed an equity lens tool for um, internal agency staff, and this tool allows us to look at um, any statute, any uh, legislative document, any policy, uh, program, or practice that's currently in place or that's proposed, so we can actually take a deep dive into what are the equity implications of this. Um, here's an example of why this has been important with some existing legislation. Um, Many of you are familiar with Act 77 and our, our um, state-funded dual enrollment program. So, um, or I'm actually, and for this example, I'm gonna use early college, which is our state-funded early college program. So early, early college um, statute, for reasonable reasons, requires us, requires students to actually um, uh, <laughs> uh, disenroll from their high school so that they can actually uh, be a full-time college student. Well. We realized um, early on that is a real challenge for students who qualify for free and reduced lunch because now they're faced with the choice of do I forego having a hot lunch and for some students that really is an issue or even breakfast and, and after school um, or do I take this opportunity um, that the state is paying for me. So, so we're using the tool both to take a look at existing statute where for, through no fault of, I think, all of us in our best intentions, we, we perhaps have set up some barriers from an equity perspective that we need to attend to. 
Um, so in that document, um, I'm very happy to share. I didn't bring copies today, but I'm very happy to um, provide that to the committee. You might be interested in looking at that. We've actually had a lot of regional attention um, from other state agencies in New England um, for that document as well. Um, and at the national level, um, some of the other state agencies out west and in the west were very excited because they hadn't started doing this kind of work. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, as of August, this just this past August, we successfully completed what we call the C project, supporting educational equity, and this was also uh, funded by CCSSO, as I just um, explained what uh, that group does and is. So our staff at the agency collaborated with a number of K-12 teachers around the state, asking them what classroom level and systemic improvements they felt were needed to fully leverage the equity changes in our um, state ESSA plan. Um, and as you'll see um, on, we are doing a better job, as you'll see on those report card documents, of actually holding schools accountable for uh, metrics from an equity perspective. So one of the actual accountability measures is how are you doing at the school level and at the district, operational district or SU level, in terms of equity gaps. Um, using um, the uh, groups that are described um, through our, our SS state plan in terms of defining equity, which I'll talk about a little bit um, more in a moment. Um, I think it's interesting to point out that many of um, the responses um, framed um, from this particular project echo uh, what the H3 bill is um, trying to do, and we are really excited about that. So. Many of the teachers focused on, um, we really need more uh, professional development opportunities. Um, we don't have enough professional development to really seriously look at equity and really seriously make sure we're doing a good job. We have the intent and we're excited about this, but we need some supports. Um, they also um, identified addition, needing additional supports for um, helping them create curricula for helping them um, purchase instructional materials and kind of make those decisions about uh, which materials um, you know, are, are the best bet in from an equity perspective, and also designing their learning environments to be more inclusive. And then this project also concluded with specific actions that the AOE plans to take to address these recommendations. Um, and I'm happy again to share that full document with the committee as well. And then, um, and again, there's other work that we're doing, but I just wanted to provide some highlights just so that um, you're aware of the work that um, has been happening um, at the agency per se. We, we have um, existing ongoing work through our professional networks at the state education agency level that focus on engendering educational equity. Um, and I think you can see this evident in many of our very recent documents and technical guidance to the field. So it's clearly a frame of our career tech and strategic vision that was recently uh, uh, developed uh, collaboratively across the state um, with a variety of different stakeholders, um, not just within education, um, this past summer. Um, you can see it in our framework for comprehensive and equity school supports, what we're actually providing to our schools um, to, to help them actually meet these accountability metrics when they're struggling. And also, um, you can see this in the mission and vision of the League of Innovative Schools, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, which is um, more of a New England regional group um, that's run through the New England uh, Secondary School Consortium. Um, it happens to be that um, the bulk of, uh, these are secondary schools, um, the bulk of uh, League of Innovative Schools are actually in Vermont, so we really, um, really resonated with this. And this stemmed from a lot of the Act 77 work, so really trying to um, enhance um, and, and best offer um, flexible pathways opportunities for students. And so Nessie actually has identified um, particular um, high schools across New England that actually are, they deem as best practice schools, and, and we, the agency, works with them um, to continue to um, spread the good word about the work that they're doing. So again, um, I wanted to just update the committee on some of that work. Um, our, our staff are very committed and excited about this work. We're proud of the work, and it's, um, as I said, part of both regional and national conversations that we continue to participate in and lead. So I do want to um, um, have, I do have some, just a few additional notes regarding the current version of the bill that I, I just wanted to uh, bring forth for the committee's consideration. 
Um, the first uh, was spoken about a couple of days ago, and I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, the disaggregation of information by student groups. Um, so I, I just, we want to be sure that the committee is aware of the implications of disaggregation by student groups as identified in the bill. As you know, our state is somewhat unique in terms of the large number of small schools, as we were talking about earlier today, that comprise our education system. And this has significant effects on what information can be reported at the student level, particularly when we're talking about highly sensitive topics, such as hazing, harassment, and bullying, or student academic performance. Um, and these, of course, are what's identified in the bill for, for a good reason. Um, so because our small school populations, uh, especially when they're disaggregated into even smaller groups, which is currently the case in Vermont for race or ethnicity, student race or ethnicity, or student ELL status, for example, um, it makes it easier for community members to identify who specific students are. And state regulations and federal regulations often don't allow public sharing of that information. Um, and it's for a good reason. We don't, we don't want the general public to have sensitive information about particular <coughs> students. That's really what this issue is about. So just in terms of the language, the way the language is written mm -hmm. in the bill. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with the language. Just as long as we understand that. Do, do you think that the language accounts for the fact that there's it's sensitive data and we're not going to be able to get it when we have a really small sample. Yep, it does. I just want to be crystal clear what yeah. that means though, which yeah. is you may have a report that is filled with a bunch of asterisks. Yeah. That means the data are suppressed. So that's all this point is about. I just want to be clear. So so I people could potentially be frustrated when they get a report back that, that doesn't have the specific group information they're looking for. But we should be able to get it at the state level. Yes, absolutely, so, so and for some will be filled in. Yes, it, it very depending, and particularly under Act Forty Six, if we're talking about um, operating districts and SUs, for okay. instance, you we will be seeing more information at a higher level. It's when you start breaking down by school, by right. by specific group, where again the information is just not legally available. And I think most of us, I see a lot of head nodding. We understand why and, and agree with that. So yes, there's nothing wrong with the language. I just want to, I feel it's my due diligence to remind the committee what this actually will look like when you're actually looking at a particular report. Um, my second point is um, attention to inclusion of students and families in distress in the bill language. As I noted, uh, the AOE is certainly supportive of the focus on equity for students from a variety of ethnic and social groups. Uh, it's important to highlight, however, that the bill's current definition of social groups does not include students or individuals and families experiencing economic distress. We realize that the overarching focus of this work will be on racial and ethnic justice efforts and do not wish to dilute that focus. However, again, we would be remiss to not point out that economic distress and disadvantage is a clear factor in many aspects of inequity within our statewide education system. In fact, it's one of the mo most robust, um, time and time again, um, indicators of um, inequity across a variety of different outcomes. So I have, um, for instance, I have shown you um, here, just for your perusal, I'm not gonna go through each of these, um, some uh, latest data um, on what um, our outcomes in terms of the post-secondary, uh, transition to post-secondary space look like, and, and we certainly have other data if the committee were interested with um, younger students that we could talk, this was just an example, showing um, that um, just as students uh, with students with disability or ELL stu students who uh, qualify for ELL services, um, we see some of the same patterns of inequity for our economically disadvantaged students. And so we just feel it important to bring that to the committee's attention um, as um, potentially um, an oversight I, we would assume unintentionally, actually. Um, I also wanted to note that our economic disadvantage factor would align um, with the agency's ESSA state plan. Um, one of the reasons that um, we actually uh, identified a super group, which is historically marginalized youth, and I forgot to mention this in point one, is because of that small sample size piece. So in order to actually hold even our small schools um, to account in terms of uh, what they're, where they're showing in terms of performance, which is the part of the purpose of ESSA. 
Um, we had, in our state plan, we developed a super group of historically marginalized students. So it actually is, it is a, a global group of students who qualify for um, any of those categories um, together because that allows us, it's different than what H3 is looking for, which is okay, but it actually allows us to then be able to say, okay, if we use as the um, frame that um, you are either an historically marginalized student for a variety of reasons or you're not, we can actually look um, at um, smaller, you know, smaller schools then and mm -hmm. be able to see um, over, over a period of time. So again, I would come back and be able to talk more about that, but that, that including um, an, some kind of mention of economic distress, students in economic distress would align a little more closely with, with our historically marginalized group, which would then also, I think, be, um, it would facilitate the, the data that we can get to. <laughs> I knew I'd weave in data somehow, right, from the last, <laughs> last presentation. Um, just a couple more points. Uh, statutes, State Board of Education rules, and curriculum development. You have already taken significant testimony from a variety of education experts on this bill, including uh, representatives from the School Boards Association, the Superintendents Association, the Principals Association, and the Chair of the State Board of Education just yesterday. As others have noted, uh, the authority and responsibility for curriculum development lies at the local level currently in Vermont. Um, the SBE adopts state education standards, and AOE's work in this area, as you heard about yesterday, has typically framed such uh, adoption requests of late on highly vetted nationally benchmarked frameworks. I'm not sure I would say that's because of staffing issues at the agency. I think it's, it's because we're coming to realize that um, why not use some great frameworks, at least as a starting point, um, and not start over from square one um, in our own state, so not having to you know, reinvent the wheel, uh, so to speak. Um, so in addition, we would also echo um, the recommendations that the work group um, review what has already been done um, in terms of other states so that we're not necessarily reinventing the wheel here. Um, in addition, we would also echo previous testimony that the real lever for the cultural shift we're all trying to achieve is not necessarily at the curriculum or standards level per se, but it's really an instructional practice. Um, we hope that this issue is considered in final del deliberations on the bill. And then finally, uh, I do want to speak just a bit to uh, agency capacity for the required work. Uh, we are concerned about the potential workload on the agency as a result of passing H3. Although, as I said, and, and really clearly uh, mean, we support the intention and goals of the bill, given our current federal and state demands, we simply at this time don't have sufficient staffing available to help the advisory group organize and collect the information required in order for this work to be successful. What would you need? Uh, we would be happy to come back with a specific proposal. We just wanted that to be sort of a thought today. We're looking to get a mark up today. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to have an actual figure for you today. It's, I have to do a little bit more, I was going to say reconnaissance, but, but certainly a little bit more uh, figuring uh, what that would look like. Um, I wonder, well, do I, would you like to talk about I, I have some questions, but yeah. I can wait. Um, we got a little bit <coughs> tangled yesterday with, um, the State Board of Education in terms of the standards. Mm -hmm. um, the bill calls for references curriculum standards. We realize that that does not exist. But we do have state standards, and those come from the national level. Mm -hmm. So the bill talks about um, adding standards. Would you, what would you, what, what would you say in terms of that language? Well, I think... Is that going to make the difference? What's going to make the difference for our yeah, kids in school? I, I think, I mean, I think how we have worked with the board um, under the education quality standards that are currently in place is we have worked with them so that the board will adopt standards in a particular arena. For instance, they have adopted ISTE standards, which are the... Um, their education technology. I don't know what this D. I, I, I got caught. It's one acronym. And, but they're the, they're the education technology standards for students. So they um, are what our education technology directors look to towards 
here, here are at a high level what I need to be ensuring that um, students are, are um, learning um, at a high level. That's what standards are, very high level. Um, we have also done that with um, C3 standards, as I know, I think you heard about yesterday. We've done that um, with art standards. We've done that with um, financial. Right now, there's a consideration to adopt financial literacy standards. So I don't think the issue is really, in, my, in our view, I don't think the issue is whether it's a national standard or not. It's, it's about the, the State Board of Education has the authority to adopt standards. So if we left the language, the work group shall review state standards adopted by the board and then recommend, we could call it changes or additions, to recognize would that language be acceptable to you? It would if you say changes to such standards. I mean, because that, I think the important point that my understanding is, I wasn't here, but from reading the testimony, um, the important point the, the, the chair of the SBE was trying to say yesterday is that they don't have control over the curriculum that, are, that emanates from those standards. They have control over just the standards, so, which are at a higher level. And I think there's just some confusion about what, do they, what, what control do they have over those standards if they're national standards? What, what control They've they adopted. Adopted. They've adopted national, if they are national standards, they've adopted them and said these are the Vermont state standards. In this case, they happen to be these national standards. And they are, and you're saying that they have made changes to those standards? They have adopted new standards. So, um, as part, they adopted the Common Core state standards right. a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, they've adopted, um, these education technology standards. Mm -hmm. They've adopted C3 standards, which is social global studies. Mm -hmm. I used to be called, I'm belying my age, it used to be social studies. So yeah. what is that called now? C3, I, acronym, I have to look up. I'm thinking that's a standard, and this might fit in. I think that, I think that, there, that has the greatest overlap. Right. Um, but I guess, I guess in a nutshell, what we're, what we're recommending is that, um, the advisory group just look to see whether there are some standards that already exist and whether they would be a fit. It's not requiring that those be the fit. They might not be a good fit. From our perspective, um, we've started with those national standards because a lot of work has been done on them. Um, a lot of really good work on these other sets of standards that I just laid out, um, which meant we didn't have to do the work if we agreed that the work was solid. Um, does that help clarify? I'm gonna let other members okay. continue. Did you have a question? No, I just I you know when I was I've been thinking about this a lot because um, it just seems the outcome we all want the same outcome. It's just the process, the implementation. I think is what is you know we need to be really intentional and thoughtful about everybody's time, the two years that the committee is going to be putting in and making sure that the outcome of that can be implemented easily and doesn't have to be revised a lot because it doesn't fit into kind of what the standards are now. But I, I think it would be helpful to look at the standards that are already we already have and see where and if, you know, what the committee would like as an outcome, you know, if there are ways it could be, you know, integrated into that. The concern I have is the curriculum at the local level. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to say this because I was thinking about this <coughs> last night. You know, there's a whole issue of bias, you know, that I don't think a lot of us are intentionally biased, but um, I think we carry that with us mm -hmm. just because we come from Certainly. a certain group or economic group, social group, whatever. And so my concern when we say we're talking to teachers about developing curriculum, for a group where we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? As, mm -hmm. as kind of white teachers in a white state, we don't know what the experience is really of an African American or a gay or, well, maybe gay, but African American, I think it's hard, or all the groups that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So my concern is, you know, the teachers that may have a bias unintentional. You know, it's just kind of the way we've grown up and, and our thinking and our lens mm -hmm. are creating curriculum, you know, that may be not accurate 
and reliable. It's to no one's fault, you know, but that, that's my concern. So um, I, think, I think certainly we would share that concern, and there's clearly research and evidence that indicates that. I mean, mm -hmm. there's an entire field of implicit bias that, that underlies exactly what you're saying, Representative Austin. I, I want to clarify, though, um, the agency's perspective is we have not been providing that training. The, the project I talked about actually asked the field, what would you need? Mm -hmm. um, and, and many of them, as I said, are recognizing just that. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, as a, a person, I'm not of an identified social group. I'm not talking personally. I'm talking yeah. kind of in the frame of, like, the general on um, this project. Um, I, you know, those teachers are identifying, like, we need... Mm -hmm. someone who has this expertise to help <coughs> us. Um, the other thing I would point out is that um, both the VPA and the VSBA and VSA combined have really also been trying to support, my understanding is, and, I, and I've been at meetings where it's been discussed, they're trying to really support the current level that has kind of responsibility for this role, which is the district, the operational district, and SEO, I'm just always going to say that. Um, that's where that responsibility really lies. And so that's, they're also on board with really trying to make sure that it isn't just, um, that, you know, they're really attuned to the issues that you're exactly talking about. Does that mean that um, something in addition isn't required necessary? Mm -hmm. Of course not. But um, I, think, I think it's part of a more robust conversation that I would hope is part of what the advisory committee would actually um, um, engage in. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. And also, um, just looking at curriculum development at the SD level, do they have a tool to see, you know, how to, do we have a tool to evaluate our curriculum to see if we have uh, implicit bias or is everybody included? I suspect some probably do, but I suspect some absolutely not. And again, we're back to yeah. the, the interest or lack thereof in, um, you know, having, having everything kind of the same. So we have a group of people who are really engaged in wanting to have an impact mm -hmm. on our schools, an identified area where bias exists, where, where people are missing in history. They are there, they're charged, and they're ready to go. <clears throat> I am trying to sort out, is this language going to, or is there other changes to this language that's going to help this group direct them to do the thing that's going to make the difference on the ground? What's going to change this culture? We've got this group of people, many of them from marginalized, sure, um, ready to go. And they're just hungry to go, and I just want to make sure I'm not sending them into something that's ridiculous. I want to send them into something where they're going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm looking at this language, and I'm, I'm trying to get that language to work to make sure that that's what we're doing. Um, so we know that we want to take out the word curriculum, because that doesn't really exist. In the framework, we heard yesterday, the framework, that's where I was when I was teaching, we were using the framework. And there was loads of places you could go in there. Mm -hmm. But it's now it's replaced by the education quality standards. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm asking you to look at page 7, um, duties of the work group, number 1. Yeah, you can sure. help her. Yeah. Thank you. That. I'm pretty familiar with it. And Thank you. look at that language and see if that language is oh, going sorry, to, you know, we've got, we've got the principals are saying it's okay, we've got the superintendents, I don't think they've got it, no, they have um, We have the NEA saying it's okay, we have the board saying it's not okay, and we're the committee that needs to sort that language out. Sure. So, I, you know, I think our sense is that given the current, short of opening up Title 16 at a, at a, at a broader level and really rethinking, um, which we're probably not going to do at this moment, maybe we will in the coming years, I think it's written the way, the only way it can be written. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that, um, I don't, it, it seems, it seems to, it seems to fit what the charge of the legislature and the state board um, are 
currently uh, required to do. So Title 16, there's a may that they may look at it. That, that's the language in the statute. But in this first paragraph, number one, under the work group, duties of the work group, um, can you show her that? You, you have it right here. Right here. Yep, right. she's got it. Shall. The work group shall review st statewide standards adopted by the State Board of Education and on or before June 30th, 2021, recommend to the State Board updates and additional standards to recognize uh, fully the history, contributions, and perspective of ethnic groups and social groups. And these, recommenda uh, these recommended additional standards are designed to, it's called, you know, and this is what they're designed to do. So, so a couple of things. Yeah. Um, so. The working group, which I call the advisory committee, and I'm sorry, um, yeah. shall make recommendations. Um, and I, I, I wondered if we wanted to make recommendations. I think you're working on that. That state board rule. State board make recommendations to the legislature or make recommendations oh. to the state board of education yeah. um, or both. I mean, it's yeah. something to kind of think about. Yeah. Um, so again, I don't see a problem with that language. I, th I think the problem that we're trying to grapple with is this would, um, again, these are recommendations, so, so should the board adopt those recommendations, yeah. um, these standards would then be in the same place as the other standards that are adopted by the board. So that's what I'm trying to clarify. They do not dictate, here's what you will do in the classroom, right. teacher, or curriculum coordinators. So that's the rub. Um, I don't see anything wrong with this language. And in fact, it actually aligns with the way we've been actually adopting other standards. Um, I cannot solve the other issue of how we actually require um, curricular change at the local level in the current context we're in. That's coming up with that self-evaluation tool for curriculum coordinators, which may be beyond the scope of what we're doing here. Representative Elder. Um, so I guess my understanding of kind of what this bill would accomplish mm -hmm. is to set a broad, um, high-level emphasis that uh, standards that uh, take in mind this type of it ethnic and racial equity are, are really which important. Which would be new. Which would be new. And so what I understand is that a lot of best practices over time are developed at the local level, and that in fact classroom educators are often at the forefront of developing that, and then to some degree through our state and local system disseminating those best practices to other schools, and then it's a, a process that takes time. Yes. Would you agree that this, simply by having a standard which does not dictate curriculum, does not reach all the way down to the lower level, to me, it feels like it would empower those who are, some people are going to be ahead of others in terms of their cultural competency and their sort of relationship with their own implicit bias. So those that are more on the vanguard of that, mm -hmm. I feel like this would empower them to start the work. Do you agree with that? Yes, it would actually, uh, for instance, here's an example, if there were resistance to that, so, so at the local level. So what standards mean are you as the local education agency are responsible for ensuring that these standards are met you may select how you ensure that students meet those standards but you have to ensure that students are actually meeting these standards they're meeting the common core standards you can choose this as an example so you can choose which particular curriculum you want to offer your students to do that you have to ensure that they're um, meeting the C3 standards because Common Core did not include global studies. Oh, next generation science standards, same thing. So it would, again, what I'm saying is it would, it would actually highlight this information mm -hmm. in that same vein that would say like you have to ensure that your students are, are um, you know, achieving these standards. Mm -hmm. I have one follow-up. Please. I just refer in equity and social groups. I mean, how broadly defined? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, your last point about agency capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so, are you saying there that in order for this, because clearly we don't want to pass a bill that that's going to run up against just sure, you know, a lack of capacity. Do we need additional appropriation? What's the upshot of that point? I'm not, I don't have, I'm not prepared to say exactly what we would need. I just want to raise the question. Um, 
it's possible um, we don't have the current staffing. Other states have actually accounted for FTE in their bills. We also could, uh, if it if it meets uh, contractual requirements, we could actually we would need funds to actually engage in a contract to actually get this information for the um, the working group. So that's kind of why I'm not I, I'm not in a position yet where I can actually have a, a robust. Um, recommendation about that. It also, I mean, I think we have time, just given the final nature of the bill. It still goes up to appropriations. And that could be the place where that, that right. sort of Right. And it's going to have to go through the other body as well. Yes. And so right. we could, I, I think that's more, I'd you know, in, in, that in transparency, that like, we haven't had enough time yeah. to mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. think that through. We're just alerting that this is a concern for right. us. I have a couple questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Boucher, for taking all this time this morning. I know we've kept you in the hot seat for a while, so I hope you're feeling all right. Yeah, um, sure. So My cold is gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're riding the wave here with us. Um, this is very helpful to get your feedback. Um, last year, uh, as you'll recall, S257 passed as amended by the House and set up this group process to start on September 1st of 2018. So I think I, I can understand why so many people are ready to go. They felt, or at least thought, that the work might begin and they're ready to start it and they're saying, why can't we just go? Yeah. So that's a challenge. Yeah, sure. Would the agency have had the same resource concerns when that bill passed? Yes. Okay. Um, in terms of the agency's capacity, there was discussion last year about the role of a facilitator. Might that be something that the agency would be interested to discuss as this bill moves through the process this year? Sure. I think, you know, it, again, in full transparency, I think the concern from our perspective is that as sort of the experts in collecting the statutes, uh, helping get out to the field to get, if we want to move to a local level, right. that's the real issue. And so, um, you know, we can't, we want to be involved, and we can't not be involved. It's really just um, trying to figure out how that's a feasible and reasonable um, lift from our perspective. So for instance, what we don't want to get into is a bill that passes and we have for the agency another mandated huge lift that we don't have the capacity to even try to, for instance, um, get some additional assistance to help with. Um, which, which, you know, has happened in the past, and I think it's been okay. We could absorb it. Um, maybe not in the past five years, but in years past when we were a fuller agency. Um, we, are, we are aware that with 173 coming in, you're understaffed for that, uh, and that's major. And we're also aware of, you know, initiative fatigue. Well, and you did, you, the legislature gave us two positions yeah. for 173, which we are hiring. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, will, we will be okay. But um, I'd like to have a conversation about classifying to uh, are, is it, are you having trouble because those people are probably have a contract until June? Are you having trouble because you're not paying enough? You know, I, is that cl the classification that they're at? Is it just the wrong one? I, well, I think, I think um, that uh, it's possible, but that's also a much broader issue in terms yes, of like the full state government right. um, issue. Not just an agency issue. So, for instance, <coughs> as you know, particularly in um, any union environment, I mean, look, we have restrictions on what we can offer. Um, it's not even so much, it is about pay, but the first place is like, what is the beginning um, starting point for a new role? And so that's the kind of thing we actually run into. I'm, I'm sorry, I have so many, I have so many questions, and I'm going to try to keep them really brief to be um, conscious of your time and everyone else's, but um, on the poverty indicator, you, re you had indicated that poverty status was an important consideration that perhaps could be better represented in the bill because we know the negative impact <coughs> on our learners. Sorry. Um, do you feel as though the reporting requirement, the data piece, which is inclusive of a poverty indicator, um, helps address some of that because that would provide us with information around the poverty question that you raised without, without actually digging into the definitions around social group and ethnic group, uh, which have been defined to include people who have been historically marginalized without a place in our education system, or at least with a much diminished presence. Do you feel as though the data piece is um, sufficient for this group to focus on those poverty indicators? 
Um, I think as um, as a former member of that social group myself, mm -hmm. I feel both professionally and personally pretty um, strongly about this. So, um, I but I also want to clarify that this is not um, an attempt to pit different social groups against mm -hmm. one another or to um, negate the um, ethnic and the ethnic focus, the ethnic group focus of the bill, as I think um, I was pretty clear in my statement. I think um, if the bill had not included other social groups, I think um, to me and to, to the agency, it seems to be a logical omission that you would not actually identify as a social group linked with an equity students who are experiencing economic distress. In other words, that in and of itself is an identity. It is an identity to actually be in a position of economic distress, just as it is an identity whether you um, have special needs, just as it is an, an ethnic identity. It's really from a, um, a multi, uh, you know, um, a multiple identity perspective, um, mm -hmm. and there's some literature on that as, as well. Okay. So I, I think our, our point for consideration is um, just considering whether that should be um, part of the social definition, which would then um, indicate that um, at, at some, you know, that there's some coverage of that in, on the working group as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not suggesting that a separate person, I mean, this is also sensitive information, so you know, how, how would you go about you know, requesting folks that, I mean, I just identified myself um, in that former capacity, but not everyone feels comfortable doing that. Um, it took me a long time, by the way, but mm -hmm. I'm now at a place in my... Thinking. Can I ask one follow-up question? Mm -hmm. and, and then I will stop. I did not ask this at the state board chair yesterday, and I wish I had. Do you support the bill in its current form? Yes, and I we would support it without any of the recommendations. These are um, these are things that we deem important. Thank you for the bill to, for the committee to consider. Can I have you look at page eight? Yeah. <laughs> the work group may review all existing state statutes regarding school policies. Is that? I have something about putting board rules in there instead. Let me show you some language. I had a discussion with some folks about how we might recraft that. Um, so if you move to so this, what I'm looking at now says state board rules and school district policies. Um, so again, that's going to be a much heavier lift. If, <laughs> if we want some kind of um, uh, some kind of um, categorizing process of school district policies. We've never undertaken that as a state. Um, so, so that would be pretty massive. Um, state board rules is also different than the standards. So mm -hmm. state board rules is also massive. I mean, it's, it's the full panoply of what the state board, ha it's basically how the state board has interpreted anything to do with legislation on education. Just want to clarify that for. Um, well, I thought that one of the ideas was that it would be standards. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. right, so there's a difference between standard, statutes is the highest level, yeah. rules and standards are, rules directly um, come from statute. Right. Standards are something that the board has a unique ability to adopt. Um, they're, they're, they're sort of separate from rules and statute so there isn't a rule there's a rule that says you have the you have the you have the authority to adopt standards i'm sure somewhere but it doesn't say that it does those don't stem from particular legislation usually so under the duties of the work group under one it's reviewing the standards uh, hello <laughs> Are you showing me your amazing background? Yeah. I think it's fantastic. I love it. Amanda, you know our little school bus, right? I know. Thank you for reminding me why I do this all the time. I don't get to see the little people as much as I would like to. batteries from the school bus. So number one is on page seven is to review the state standards. Number two is to review statutes. Yes, okay. Um, 
regarding school policies. Um, so what is the question? Is, you know, and then I see the word curriculum under A, ensuring that the school curriculum promotes critical thinking. I'm just wondering, um, do we have a problem here? Well, we use that word that we're not supposed to touch. Yeah. Um, it also might make sense, um, that is an issue because for the conversation that we just had, but it also might make sense to, um, it depends on how broad you want that state statutes. Like, do you want that, if you stick at statutes, do you want those that just pertain to standards development or curriculum development? Otherwise, again, it's the entire it's the entire body. Perfect. Statutes is the entire body of what this 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 General Assembly has right. put forth. It's all of those books in reality. <laughs> yes, and then it would be um, identifying what's still on the books, what's not, what's been um, uh, adopted. And I'm not saying I don't have a strong opinion on that, other than what I've already said about our ability to help with that. But I just want to. I'm trying to help clarify. Um, for the committee, what what this language, to my understanding, um, actually means. Do others have a question on this? Yeah, um, you know, being a former teacher and mm -hmm. school board member, my thinking is when I was writing standards. I mean, I think the first step is an excellent step that they look that the committee look at the state standards because I think, you know, that will help them see, you know, how to how to inform their thinking a little bit about um, how how they want to get to the outcome. So then I think. The next step is for them, as a group, to come to co some consensus amongst themselves about the skills and knowledge and values they would like to see um, students leaving Vermont schools with. Mm -hmm. And then the third part would be the implementation. And the, that's, the implementation to me is the, the planning to me is pretty, I mean, as a teacher, is, was really enjoyable. I enjoyed it. It's the implementation to me where I, I am hoping that some real thinking goes into this in terms of trying to get that outcome that, that this group and I think all of us want. So do you see it that way in that kind of I do, I do. And you reminded me of another piece that I learned um, a long while ago which has helped, which is, you know, as you move from statute rule, you could think in this particular case, even though it doesn't naturally flow, but um, a standard you're moving from almost like a cudgel approach, like like everyone shall do this, to okay, you're getting much more down to the meat of what's happening as you go further down. And so right. I think I think the the committee and, and uh -oh. the, the group, the coalition, just needs to kind of wrestle with that, mm -hmm. or um, you know, figure out like where where is the lever. Um, and if it's all levers, that's okay, but that's a, a much more massive task. Um, and it might then be something you want to consider doing in, uh, over several years, for instance. Um, I wish I had the silver bullet answers that you're looking for, Chair Webb. They, if it had a silver bullet, it would have already been done. <laughs> that's never, true. It never comes to us that here's the silver bullet. And right. we'll get to it. We're all done yet. Right. I think the good thing is we're, we're we're all trying to get on the same yes, path together, which yeah. is which is There's kind of an exciting place to make a difference here. There's tremendous mm -hmm. amount of motivation from this committee, mm -hmm. from the advocacy group, and from this, from mm -hmm. all stakeholders. That there is a including the state board, as was testified. Including the, um, I would almost yesterday. say especially the state board. Mm -hmm. the, um, in my Congress, I mean, actually, the the chair of the board is actually teaching this stuff. Mm -hmm. She's actually teaching the diversity right. issues. Yeah, and she's doing that today. Mm -hmm. Um, so they review all existing state statutes. Would you change that to Title 16, or would you focus it even more? Um, if I were, I, I can't speak on behalf of the coalition. Right. So again, um, they will, I promise you, they will speak on behalf of themselves. Sure. <laughs> so, so it's hard for me to answer that question because. The intent of the bill could have, you know, there could be different intents for the bill. So, so if the intent of the bill is to have, for instance, as 
as legal and close a connection to change instruction, then no, that's far too broad because, because most of the work would be spent on looking at the entire set of green books. Right. This has no restriction time-wise even, in terms right. of like starting in year whatever. Um, that you'd really want to look at. Um, and again, um, however, you might want to do that if, you're, if the intent is to really look at, um, you know, who knows, bias has started in, at, the, at, the stat, at the statute level um, forever. Again, um, those are both worthy goals. I can't, I can't answer what the ultimate goal is um, for um, the committee. Well, they have they have goals that they've listed here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let Representative Cooper speak. Have and by goal, I'm sorry, I mean like which level to yeah. which level to actually move in to actually meet the goals is what okay, I'm talking about. Can you go about. to uh, can you go to page two? Sure. Line sixteen. It says in some instances teachers employ curriculum materials and lesson plans that promote racial stereotypes. And then go back to page eight. How do we, and, and I can see where there may be an issue on line four, ensuring that the school curriculum promotes all the way through line 16. I mean, uh, how do you, going back to the biases again with, with teachers or students? You could um, you adopt a particular standard that says, um, you must ensure, this is just as one example, you must ensure, you know, that students are provided, I'm looking at page two, where that is, um, provided with um, um, materials that do not promote historical racial stereotypes. That could be part of a standard. But again, that isn't saying how the classroom or the school would do that. So that's the point I keep trying to make. It's, mm -hmm. you, can, you can make standards that say what you want. I think you would get into some political challenges in terms of implementation if you try to make a standard say your curriculum has to be this, because there really is a distinction between what a curriculum is and what a standard is. That's where, yeah, that's where my confusion is. A standard is a, a higher, um, a curriculum is more specific. A curriculum is here's the set of lesson plans that are going to meet this standard. So as an example, I'm using science. Um, students need to know, I'm just going to pull something out, like details of the Copernican Revolution. I think I remember hazily what that is. <laughs> so um, a curriculum would be unit one. This is introduction to Copernican revolution, and I'm trying to do something neutral, which it's not, because this is a very Western um, <laughs> topic I've picked. Um, you know, assignment one, assignment two, assignment three. Like that's what a that's no. what the curriculum is. It's it's that level of detail. So that's no. understandably why. Dude, well, and, and then in the curriculum are lesson plans and those kinds of things. But that's I think why historically. Um, for good or not, that's been left at that local level because folks haven't really wanted to entertain how you might, um, you know, dictate that level of specificity um, to a person who's teaching. We're in a situation where if those are biased and, and, and what is actually being done at the, at the classroom level or the school level is, is not working, we're trying to figure out, like, how do we actually make that happen? You know, Texas has a state curriculum. It says, do, 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 this is actually what you will teach and this is how. We are not, that's not who we are right now. And what you want. Maybe, maybe Texas. never. And I'm, I'm neutral on that. Like, <laughs> you just got everybody nervous when you said right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, and I knew when I said that. <laughs> from, from, from a purely bureaucratic perspective, how easy is it, right? From like an actual, like, do I want to be a teacher anymore, ever? No, because, you know, you are you could feel like a robot then. Mm -hmm. does, it, does it mean that, um, that these are not, 
really thorny, very important issues that we need to wrestle with? Of course not. Um, so I hope that nothing I'm saying is coming across as glib or as flip, mm -hmm. um, that this is not something. It's just, it's, it's complex and, and it has, um, it, it has uh, implications for the way we have set up our entire education system in terms of, again, what is the lever we're trying to actually use to get what we want at this point in time. I, I, whatever, you can't, you can't change culture in two years, right? And so that would be some, another way to think about. Yeah, if you consider when, when we abolish slavery, we still have a long way to go. And it's been well over 100 years, 150 years. So. We can make a, a heck of a lot of progress yes, in two years, progress. certainly. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to just one, one that I will get back to. I, I'm getting back to because I'm really working on language right now. Um, yeah. In terms of this work group, may review all existing state statutes and we can work on that language. But to review what the goals are, the goals are to ensure that the curriculum promotes these things and ensures the engagement opportunities that provide families a welcoming means of raising any concerns and will include a report. So I'm, what, what are your thoughts on the I mean, design? again, given the conversation we've had, you might consider um, ensuring that the standards um, promote these things. Ensure that the, instead of the school curriculum, ensure that the standards. Or ensure that, Trying to think of some other things that have been passed. Um, the standards promote. The standards promote, but I'm also trying to think about, or that you know, you do you do have some authority to say that when the statute that promote. operating districts, schools, um, and schools, um, <laughs> you know, abide by these standards. I mean, you could you could say that. Yeah. So ensuring that that these schools <coughs> promote critical thinking. You, you could say that they promote, but that's all in the standards are there. Right. They're all about critical thinking. Well, no, I, I didn't read the rest of the sentence. Oh, okay, sorry. So again, because what we're looking for is a specific language that's going into this bill. Mm -hmm. I want us to get this, get this sorted out. And it's a goal, it's not a mandate. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> I mean, another way to maybe think about this is that the, the education system is very used to the state board adopting standards. Yeah. So that would be something that they would be um, expecting. And as I also pointed out, and I think you've heard testimony on, um, our educators are not resistant to this cultural change as a group. They're, they're, they're interested in doing this work. So it may make sense, just as a thought, experiment to actually start with standards and then come back <coughs> once some progress has been made on that to come back to statute depending you know and again I, I didn't mean to alarm people with I mean no one wants a Texas model no, no, <laughs> we, we understand that but, but to be able to come back and then say okay so we have these standards how's it been going we would then also probably have some best practices like of curricula right um, at the local level within Vermont to actually be able to showcase and use now, this has been really helpful is it possible um, I know where it feels like we're starting markup with a we, additional we committee member. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm one, one and, and we, we've taken so much of Dr. Boucher's <laughs> time, and it's helpful to have an expert witness. I just wonder if we could have a five minute break to recollect. And I think that's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and would you, are you able to stay in the room? Um, I'm actually, uh, I, I really needed to leave at 10.30, so. Um, well, you're on lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, so but if you want to shoot me some messages yeah. on some specific you know, <clears throat> language, I'm we can do very right fine with that. We've got, we've got some people coming at 1145. We have time after okay. the floor and after the governor's address to, to you know, if, we, if some questions come up during our markup. But I, I think that's right. Thank you, Dylan, for that. Mm -hmm. um, we will take a break. We very much appreciate your input. It's extremely helpful. Great. Thank you. I'm very um, happy to yeah. help. Yeah. 1145. Oh, then 45 canceled. Okay. At least don't need that time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
What time would you like us back here? Definitely. <laughs> oh, definitely. Uh, Jay, <laughs> why don't we take, why don't we take ten minutes? So let's say eleven twenty. Does that Very sound good. fair for everybody? Well, it sounds Thanks. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. So, what's your name? Okay, um, Jim, why don't you join us? Um, I was going to have Peter just do a, a, a kickoff of, of this discussion that we're about to have in terms of this bill, just to kind of focus on the big picture of what we're up to. So, yeah, kind of so these are, this is going to in, include basically some of my personal views on, on where we go. And I think we're thrown for a little bit of a curve yesterday. Um, but I think what we're, what we're dealing with is what we'd like to see happen, which is effective, uh, affect what's going on in the classrooms, and really what can we do at the level that we sit up here in the committee. And I think what we've learned, that we should all be very clear at all times, is we can't dictate curriculum. The Department or the State Board of Education doesn't dictate curriculum. So we're not going to be able to affect that. So what, what can this bill do? I think, um, I think um, Heather Boucher kind of hit the nail on the head that the bill is sort of written the only way it can be given our current system of, of how we do things. I think there are some small um, word changes we can make. The, the word curriculum is a, a little bit of third rail. But so, so this working group is going to be really tasked with, as, as um, she said, uh, wrestling with which levers can be pulled and which levers to pull. And I think that this bill sort of gives them that ability to, to do that. And again, what they come out with are really strictly recommendations anyway. Um, and, you know, so, but let's say that they're going to be focused on standards, they come out with standards, and standards are adopted. So what's the power of a standard? We've learned that, well, Still, curriculum is done at the local level. But I think that another thing that I heard today that really resonated was that standards at least have the power to counter local resistance to change. In other words, if a, if a school is saying, we need to be more, have a more inclusive curriculum, and here's where we're going to go, they can fall back on the standards and say, you know, and we're doing this because the state standards say we need to. Uh, and that seems to be, to me, that, that is the direction that, that this is going. It's not going to solve implicit bias and racism in our communities, uh, but it's going to take a, a hopefully a step there. Um, and you know, we were talking a little bit about the part that that um, where they can also be effective, which is looking at state statutes, and we may want to put you know uh, some parameters on that, maybe just looking at educational state statutes and looking at the wording to see if they could be worded somewhat differently. But that would come back to that would come back to us to then make changes with recommendations. And then finally, there's uh, always the question of what can the AOE do? What's their capacity? Can they staff it? Uh, the, to me, the bill doesn't, doesn't yet define, or the working group doesn't yet define what it is they want from the AOE. So we don't even know what they're, what, what's being asked of them. And maybe that's something that gets dealt with at a later date where they, they say, you know, we need all this assistance from the AOE, and then the AOE comes in with a request. But I'm not sure we're at that point yet. So I felt far more comfortable <coughs> with what we have um, today uh, compared with yesterday afternoon. Mm -hmm. my, my high view of it. And we're also just reminding folks that this is uh, what's happening this year. There will be a report back. They may be asking for some other things. They may be asking for resources. They may be asking for other changes. But this is at least getting the process started. So, with that, <clears throat> let's, anybody, any other comments? Why don't we just, any other comments right now on, on the big picture of what we're trying to do? <clears throat> and we're going to let this be a little bit more discussion-like as we're going along here. So shall we, shall we start looking at the words? Okay. So, page one. Let me know if you want this on the screen or not. Yes, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The version that was that already now? The yes, the, the in, as introduced version of the bill. Okay. Mm -hmm. Publicly or just on the screen right now? Like you want it on my Oh, it, no. it um, I, I, I we want to look at it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. It's already online. So we want to look at it. Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know how to get out that Two four six eight ten. We don't. We, oh, two four six eight. We haven't. We haven't amended it yet. No. We're gonna try to. One that one. One Okay. So the first is starts is the statement of purpose that the bill is introduced. Now, just remind us what we can change and what we can't change. We can't change subject, right? You can't change the statement. Statement of purpose as introduced, because oh. that's as introduced it doesn't yeah. change. Yeah. Now you can change the um, I'm like 17, the act title. Okay, we can change that. Yes. If we strike all the bill, can we change the purpose? No, nope, because that doesn't get struck. That just will remain. It won't go anywhere. I'll just be sitting there as introduced. Yeah. Uh, you'll be doing a strike all of the text of the bill. Okay. Yeah. So if we wanted to change this, we would have to have a committee bill. Um, yes. You, the way this would be framed, yeah. usually, is an amendment, a committee amendment to this bill. Yeah. A report by the committee amending this bill. Uh, I suppose you could start a whole new bill, which is a committee mm -hmm. bill. Right. So I just that there were some, some questions about the statement of purpose. So let's just read the statement of purpose and see if there are things that people needed to change about that. <laughs> Are there problems with the purpose? Yes. Representative Mavis. Uh, yesterday, the state board said they don't publish data. Like right. Well. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. That's why I have the AME question there. That, that has to change. Right. So that does have to change. Can we just add, like, that doesn't identify a student? That, that's in there. It's in there. Oh, it's so in there. Um, so that's what, what, what degree what possible. Yeah. So what's the concern to change? But just we need to change State Board of Education to agency. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Dylan. Could I have one? Jim, a technical question. What? The statement of purpose refers to the bill as introduced. Correct. That's for the baseline. When H3 was presented, it was this. Had I, you know, as a co-sponsor, had I put in a section about uh, cat food, just throwing a random example out there, it would say something about cat food there, but when the bill passes, the cat food isn't there. Okay, that's true. So It's it's the statement of purpose as introduced. Okay, as introduced. it's going to be completely a different goal by the time it gets through the process. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so we're true. addressing that in the body of the bill. Yeah, right. We're addressing and, that and language. Just one other question. The statement of purpose does not go into the green books. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Also, Thank you. I'd say uh, the point about the um, just raised mm -hmm. about the State Board of Education uh, changing to AOE, the requirement on page 11 of this bill is the current statute. These are the state board's powers and duties. It says the state board shall report annually on all these things, which is uh, where they have to basically be reporting on these different categories. So I'm confused by that comment that the state board doesn't publish this stuff because I think it does. It's required to. Okay. Is this, are we so far agreeing with the commissioner and the secretary? No. No. Yeah. And can I just comment on that as well? I have my big green education book from the School Boards Association for Title 16 yesterday, and I looked at the reference here, section 164, and I could pass it around and people really want to see it. There's a whole section about what the state board reports. So I was I was conflicted and confused when I heard that testimony yesterday. I think we're stuck on two different words, report and publish that. That might be it. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, all right. But isn't that what she said? Report? Not she said publish. publish. Well, she said publish a report. <laughs> so I think therein lies the difference a little bit. Because sure. to report on something could be to make someone else's publication known. Yeah, yeah report yeah. on something and sitting right up here just right. talking to us. Right, yeah. so I think it's the they don't publish their own report. Whereas <clears> like this report, by, and maybe that, Jeff, is also wrong, but I didn't know that might be the distinction. Yeah. Right. 
So, do we have anything about them publishing, publishing <laughs> in on page 12? Uh, it says report. It just says report. Yep. Yeah. And the current section of law says report. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. so, would you say that again, Dylan? If, if you were to go to the green books yeah. of what exists in law now versus what we're proposing here, just, it, just so that we're all on the same page, we have some new members, the language that is presented without a line underneath it or without the strike through is current law. So on line 17, that 17 corresponds to the big green book of how the education laws are organized. And the additions would be, in this case, there's a struck out school by school has been replaced with supervisory union and school district basis. But the report is already in law, just not with the specific pieces that we've added on page 12, starting on line 5. Our underlined, the underlined pieces there are what we're adding to their report that already exists. The reporting requirement, I guess, is what I think. And if you look at page 12, you'll see the, the, the language um, series to the extent consistent with state and federal laws regarding the state office. Okay. So, so that protects that, that um, privacy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I'm a little confused, and I think it's a, we're talking about a technical issue of what we can and can't do here with a bill. The AOE is a is the group that collects this information, the AOE is the appropriate organization to publish this information. Why can't we just make it AOE? We can't. I'm going to say, uh, but I'm here, we can't change the statement of purpose. Yeah. So we're not worried about, I guess we're, I, I'm comfortable in not worrying about the statement of purpose at this point, because that's going to be wrong anyway. Okay, okay. very good. Yeah. But, but what happens with that data, we do care about. Yeah. <laughs> that's already in law, right? So that's already in law. It's the report that the yeah. state board publishes, it, so reports, and the secretary uses. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and after the social equity study standards for public schools, here we go. So, the findings. Uh, Chair, right before you move on there, yeah. the, the um, title of the bill uh, says public schools. I think you have to testimony about oh, opportunity yeah, yeah, yeah. schools, so mm -hmm. I might affect this language. Right. And we have, let's see, we have Chair Rutherford and Chair Rutherford. Yeah. Right. Um, not sure, was that, was that? <coughs> I understand in terms of independent schools um, that they follow NEASC, and NEASC I think has some strong language about that, but I, I'm, I'm speaking from hearsay. Um, I also think that I saw a message from one of the people saying that they want to be included. Hmm. <coughs> um, NEASC is voluntary for independent schools, though? Am I right about that? And then the BTA, and we had received testimony also from the NEA saying that they had a preference for this to apply to private schools, but they didn't describe what the mechanism for doing so would be. Can I just take a moment just to introduce Martha Allen, who is president of the Vermont um, Hi, Martha. NEA, <laughs> and who is now an equity coordinator for teachers in Vermont. Train, you know, creating a website for teachers. So, excuse well, me. I'm I sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to see if we can. Let's, let's hold that for a minute. Let's hold that one. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm just wondering, you know, is, is the, what do we just say, publicly funded schools? So that if you were, you know, to kind of say that if you receive public funding, you're covered by this, is the issue that the independent schools might feel they don't have enough of a carved out position in the working group? Is that the concern with doing that? Or would that be a way to just kind of say, instead of public schools, just publicly funded schools? And that would serve as an umbrella. We're just about to walk into a tangled area. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we don't know is the power that we, first of all, there's different levels of, of private schools. 
So oftentimes we're sort of mistaken with the historic academies that operate really just like a public high school with all the others, the Red Cedars and all that. Right, but like Red Cedar, they get it, public funding. funding. Um, but I'm not sure we have the, we, we don't know yet if we have, the, if the Agency of Education or the State Board of Education has the power. Do you have any thoughts, Jim? Okay. Sorry, I was distracted by it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Can you repeat your question? Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, we are wondering in terms of strict in for public schools, we're wondering where the independent schools fit in on this. And I will get some someone in from the independents to speak to us. But do you have any thoughts on what our what our parameters are with that? Um, I think they're one step away, even from public schools, in terms of curriculum. Yeah. Um, they're more independent. <laughs> yeah. In terms of, of that. Yeah. Um, so there might be you know an angle there, uh, in terms of uh, of which schools to include. Include if you did, if you included approved independent schools, it would cover those schools that receive public tuition. It would also cover those schools who are approved that don't receive public tuition, which are some of the sectarian schools like Rice. Yeah. Uh, so you have a choice to make there, so whether it's all approved independent schools, which, are, which are, would include the devices, or only approved independent schools who take public tuition. I, I, personally, I think we're just talking about the that take public tuition. I don't want to get into rights, but yeah. In terms of uh, the, the act title, we can amend the act title. Mm -hmm. Could we amend it to say an act relating to ethnic and social equity study standards for Vermont's education system. That sounds like it could be brought up into the post secondary. Okay, that, that's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. So we don't want to dictate post secondary, I would guess. No, we don't. And I just texted Maggie about this Yeah. Do we want to hold on this one? Do we have a language? So we can't, we can't say approved. Yeah. We can't add approved independent schools. It's a policy, policy decision by you. It's your choice. The parochial schools are, those, those, some of those are approved. Right. Some of them are approved, and they don't receive public funding. So you yeah. could exclude those if you wanted to. Is there a way to, is there a way to address it? it what would be the language? Um, to address those that are receiving public dollars? I would just say approved, in, in, approved independent schools that receive public tuition, basically. Mm -hmm. Maybe not that language exactly, but it's yeah. like that. Yeah. So let's, let's just um, look at that. We, we're going to try to find Patty Conlon, who, um, who represents the independent schools. Can you just uh, say where that language is? It's, um, where, where would be added? it's right here at the bottom of page one, on okay. um, line 17, 18. Or, or so this is still something we need to address. <laughs> or, or not. Or not? I mean, because we could, we could say, let's not have that right now, and it could be addressed in the Senate. Yeah, you just have to be ready to address that on the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah Representative Jane Batista. Perhaps you could just strike for public schools and just say an act relating to ethnic and social equity studies standards. This is, this is the act title. It is not the text of the bill. Education standards? That doesn't necessarily get the independent schools to get, but they're not required to follow the standards. You know what? We're going to get bogged down there, but let's come back to that one. So the findings. <coughs> And we know we have one request where it says indigenous, any place where it says indigenous, to call Abnaki and indigenous. And other indigenous. And other indigenous. People. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Everybody okay with that one? Mm -hmm. Anybody have a problem with that? Um. Yeah, I, I'm fine with it, but it, it exists in a quotation. <coughs> so it, it, it's if we change the quotation, we got to take out the quotation. Oh, you're right. Mm. Okay, so let's, 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 let
That, so we probably can't do it there because it's a quote, very good catch. I'm glad you were on our committee. Um, but it shows up in other places, like in the definition of ethnic groups. So thank you. So we don't want to address it in the findings. Okay. Good catch. So starting on page four then, you would have it in the definitions. Mm -hmm. and we would have it, yes, we have it in the definitions. So these are findings. Um, and does anybody have any problems with the findings? Yeah. I'm still bothered by line 16 on page two. In some instances? Yep. Yeah. In some instances, teachers employ curriculum materials and lesson plans that promote racial stereotypes with the quotes. I would like that stricken. One of the many problems highlighted was, this is a quote. <clears throat> So you don't want that quote in there, even though it's something that they did comment. It's a finding from another study. But it, it relates to, in my mind, it relates to all teachers that promote racial stereotypes. That's for some reason I I can't. In some camp. It does say in some instances. Well, it's also it's saying the curricula materials promote racial stereotypes, right. not the teachers. Mm. Right. The no. teachers employ the curriculum materials. Okay, so your concern is is your feeling this implicates all it, teachers? That, that's that's what I'm seeing here. Mm. If there was a word between promote and racial, like inaccurate. Well, again, we're in, a, we're in the middle of a quote. Oh, I see. Yeah. Anyone else? I, I, I had, um, you know, it took me a few reads on that sentence to understand it when I first read the findings last year. But when you read it, it's referring to materials in 2003. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that materials would have changed much today. We don't know. This group is trying to find mm -hmm. out. But curriculum, clearly if it's not... We've identified a problem that the curriculum, in many cases, might not represent all peoples in our history. We've heard a lot of testimony to that effect. And here, given that the finding is now 15 years old and a relevant piece of the historical record, um, I think it's an important piece of information that guides our, our thinking in adopting this bill and, and moving it through the process. And as I look at it, I, I think that the, in some instances I think it does make it clear that this isn't necessarily something that's applying to all teachers or all curricula, but the way it's the way that the quotation is inserted without an ellipses is a little strange to me because from 15 to 16, one of the many problems highlighted was quote curriculum issues in the state public schools. It reads like its own sentence, but in fact, we don't know what the first half of the sentence was in the quotation. So it's a little different than Larry's point, but as I look at it more closely, I, I think that quotation could have been a little more, um, maybe a little less artfully inserted and a little more accurately inserted. I'm not saying that it's missing the point. It's just that it, I usually don't like to see a, a sentence that's half made of a partial quotation. Uh, not being bogged down into diagramming sentences here, but we could <laughs> we could move the quote How's that the, the, the quote uh, at the end of the you know states public schools. Take the quote off from the word before curriculum, states public schools, put a colon there, then start the quote in some instances. And again that seems cleaner to me. Again yeah. to, to bog down in diagramming sentences. It does say in some instances, uh, it's talking about teachers employing curriculum, but the curriculum and materials promote, not the teachers promote. So one of the one of the problems highlighted at that time was curriculum issues of the state public schools period, and then the quote. Yeah. So don't quote the curriculum issues. You're talking about moving the quote. I am. I, I yeah. guess I'm not trying to get bogged down. You mean taking out curriculum issues in the state? So one schools. of the many problems highlighted. Maybe could say in 2013, I mean 2003, get rid of the quote. Uh, one of the problems was in 2003 was curriculum issues in the state's public schools. 
If that removes the editorializing of the placement of the quote. Stating that yeah. quote. Seems clear. And if you really want to sort of remove the emphasis off of teachers, you can move the whole beginning of the quote to um, quote curriculum materials and lessons plans that promote racial stereotypes. And it's really talking about so, only materials. That so promote. we could actually put the quote at imp uh, uh, quote at the <coughs> curriculum materials. Yeah. That some some schools continue to employ curriculum materials and lessons plans. So take the. Caleb like in there. I'm certainly <coughs> comfortable with that. Yeah, just I just like to make it clear when you're putting together an explanatory sentence with a quotation into one yeah. sentence. I don't know. I, I, English major here, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and over here, you were English major. I wasn't, but I was a newspaper editor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and then harassment. So if people look over, just make sure that, because I, I think I want to make sure we're moving on to the part of the bill. <coughs> so definitions, ethnic groups, this is where we wanted to um, add Abnaki and other indigenous people. Director of Asian Racial Equity. I would propose that that go in. Sure. Okay. Just as a member. As a member. As a member of the board. Yeah. Not as a convener, not as a member. <coughs> so, um, so those are, and in terms of the members, we have, and then the eight members, and they are to be selected by, okay, eight members are members. Who appoints those members? Do we say who appoints those members? The members that are appointed by the uh, coalition. By the coalition. That's by the okay. Okay. Good. So we're going to stay out of that and let them appoint their members. Sound wise? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Chief Stevens should ask them. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Not us. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So then we have, and the other question was, do we need someone from independent schools? But what about a student member? That's part of the that coalition. Part of the coalition. That can be part of the coalition. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone agrees that's important. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm comfortable having that conversation and thinking about it as the process moves forward. I'm comfortable yeah. with them. Yes. You already have the independent schools here. Oh, we do? Yep. Okay, um, it's on line 11. Okay, great. Yeah. I just would like to um, advocate again for a historian who's trained. Who's tra I mean, I'm not seeing. We have a Vermont based college level uh, faculty expert in ethnic studies. Yeah. Um, line 16 on page 4. But is that a historian or is that. I mean, it understands history. I can imagine if someone's doing ethnic studies, yeah. they're going to have to have yes. a historical yeah. perspective. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, I believe uh, yesterday in our testimony from expert from Oregon that she had said that in their experience engaging with historians um, that if typically individuals who have expertise in ethnic or social equities curriculum would actually be historians traditionally. And so I think that um, the intent of the law around that will come through, probably be reflected in the selection. Can you talk about knocking off the assistant attorney general? Yeah. Yes. We're going to replace it with the executive director of racial equity. Yep. So we're not changing from 17. No. Okay. Yeah. How is pre-K getting in here? <clears throat> Through the NEA. Okay. And the Vermont Curriculum Leaders Association. The leaders, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> down to uh, on page 5, uh, line 13, appointment and operations. Um, yes, they, the Abnaki wanted to be included in that. I, I, we're agreeing that we're just going to leave it to the coalition. They can ask the coalition to be one of that. I would imagine the coalition has an interest in including them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the working group shall represent the graphic geographic network.
been here for three years. We discussed that. Okay. Is that done in two years? So the working group shall cease to exist in July 22, so that's three years? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. It's okay with me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> this is going to take some time. Yeah. yeah. Can they ask? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can they ask for an extension? If yeah. Okay. It happens all the time. Okay. You may have noticed that we've been dealing with that question of late in another area now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> um, and the secretary of education can be the first working group. Um, was this appropriation? This was updated with current numbers, correct? I'll, I'll reconfirm it. Uh, there's a formula that JFO had that used yeah. to compute this. So I'll go back and check. <coughs> this will be, if we pass this out, this will go up to appropriations anyway, John. Right. The only change here, I think, you would want to check with, um, with JFO is if you are taking a state employee and the racial equity director. Um, in, in place, oh, I'm sorry, they were both state employees. I'm mixing them up. For some reason, I thought we subtracted them. Yeah, yeah. I'm starting to get fried, so don't mind me. Oh, they talked about this bit. Uh, that was if they were going to be going through statutes. Right. Um, <clears throat> and since that's a, they might do it, might not do it, I'd say we hold off on that. Yeah. yeah. My recollection was that the school boards association had encouraged Visbit. Um, but felt as though their representative could encompass that viewpoint and bring it to the working group. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, we get to this yes. well, that the duties. And I'm realizing <laughs> yes. that it's noon. Um, we're going to do our best to, to complete this in 15 minutes. If not, we'll do our best to do it in half an hour. <clears throat> okay. So we know on line four, we want to strike the word curriculum. I, I heard yesterday that I should just have the word standards yeah. and may not even want statewide in there. Yeah. I think we're confused here a second refer to the statute yeah. that uh, requires the state board to uh, issue standards. So I could look at this statutory requirement. So, to review, so you're saying, I didn't quite, quite hear you. So the working group shall review that, uh, you can say statewide, but statewide standards um, I'm, I'm, uh, adopted by the State Board of Education under Section 1 6, whatever it is. Yeah. So just to make sure it's linked back to the statutory requirement. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. <coughs> okay. So they have two years to review that. So, recommend that the State Board updates and additional standards to recognize fully the history contributions, perspective of ethnic groups and social groups. These re uh, recommended additional standards shall be designed to. Are we, where are we with that language? Dylan, do you have a comment on that? No, I, I support the language in the proposal. Um, based upon the many discussions along the way. Um, and, you know, this is a working group. Yeah. They're trying to work through a wide array of, of items. If they find that any of this language conflicts with any of their goals, I'm sure they'll be back to tell us with right. their report, and that will give us a chance to check in. Yeah, so this is a work in progress, Chris, remember that. <coughs> okay, with that take? Chris? Yep. Okay. So then we have the uh, 9 through 20. Anything in there? Serena? Um, I'm, just, I mean, I'm just glad that the um, coalition is going to look at standards, one yeah. of the first things, because I, I do think a lot of this is, is there. Yeah. This one from mine. Not, maybe not all of it, but. Okay, then we get to the one about the statutes. What's the group two? So might we limit it to Title 16? Of course, education shows up in other statutes, with other books as well. Yes. Uh, it, it does. It shows up. <laughs> It does, but since they're focused on on standards and effective curriculum, you might 
frame it that way. Okay, can you do that language to frame it that way? So that might be the word relevant in place of all existing? Well, I could just come up with the language. Yeah, we'll specify okay. what relevant means. Okay, wonderful word, relevant. relevant. <laughs> do you have a um, recommendation? <laughs> Was that from uh, Dr. Boucher this morning? Maybe I'm misremembering, but I had written down review all existing state Board of Education rules, substituting Board of Education rules for statutes. I'm not really suggesting, and I just wrote it down. I forget why. I feel like somebody recommended it. <laughs> there was some conflicting information provided by um, different constituencies that I've been in contact with recently. And Given the Deputy Secretary's testimony from this morning, I'm inclined not to touch that for now. If you're limiting the scope just to statutes that deal with standards and curriculum, do you want to change the made or shall? Wait a minute. No. 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 Because if they're, I think the reason there is to, is to give them the option of working on what they need to work on. And if they've got time and energy to be able to do this. They're going to be really busy. But I don't want to, re I don't want to require them. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I'm not going to require um, But in terms of line four, ensuring that school curriculum, is that the word that we want? Or do we want to change that to oh, yeah. standards? Or, or what do we want to do? Ensuring that what <laughs> promotes critical thinking regarding the system? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, so I was thinking. Uh, it's a, it was a, ensuring that schools promote critical thinking, include mm -hmm. content. Yeah. Doesn't use that, the word curriculum. Is that okay? It's a problem. Our lawyer. <laughs> I, I think it's better. Yeah. Or do we yeah, say so publicly, all publicly funded schools? Yeah, well, <laughs> well I was just, <laughs> at the end of the bill, when you're talking about the state board adopting <coughs> standards, you can specify them what uh, uh, what they apply to or what they could apply to. Okay. So you can do that later. Yeah. So yeah. Can we say schools instead of just say schools? That's what we're saying, schools? Yeah. So Jim, you're saying schools would be okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, everybody good with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Writing this report, or is this the vendor writing this report? <laughs> we can't challenge you too much. Staff, right? Who <laughs> 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 generally, writes, generally writes these reports when we have a working group? It doesn't say publisher report. It just says <laughs> right. report. So <laughs> there might be a man that's Shell report. Okay. Shell sure. report. Yeah. And, and I, this language uh, resembles other reports that I've worked on as a staff person yeah. in my days in state government at times. Yeah. And um, typically there is technical expertise provided yeah. by an agency. In this case, it would be the Agency of Education. But I will say, in my experience, it's the stakeholders who really have a lot to do with the quality and breadth of the report. Right. So with the, the excellent representation here, I imagine it would be a team effort. Yeah, I think so. So we're OK? And hopefully they have an English major or a newspaper editor, <laughs> like, like this committee. So. Excuse me, can I, can I know one thing um, yeah. on this language here? So the first duty is to look at, obviously, standards. The second is to look at statutes. And now they're issuing a report. And the report includes um, uh, any statute, now it says state board rule, or school district policy. Um, so now it's bringing in state board rules and school policies, oh, yeah. but they hadn't been introduced earlier. Right. Yeah. Yeah, should we make their report be just on the progress of their work? In well, the, 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 the uh, section to come talks about exactly what that's a report. We'll get to that section. Um, so this is more about the content such a content of the report. Um, so, recommendation for language? 
I'm not saying it's wrong, by the way. I'm just saying that I mean, they can look at this stuff anyway, they can look at whatever they want to look at, and they have to find things they can report it. So I'm just saying it's the first time these. We haven't used the word state court. Really come yet. in before, yeah. yeah. No one's excluded your policy. Thoughts? Hmm. Um, Is there another way to have them present that doesn't use words we haven't introduced before? Can I take the words out? Should there just be a date there? Uh, so we, we could drop that paragraph mm -hmm. because um, on page 10, line 17, we have them submitting a report yeah. that includes recommended statutory changes, recommendations for training. Peter, what line are you on? Uh, so I'm on page 10, yes. line 17. So there's a date. Okay. Okay, so what's the difference between that? This, this thing and this one back here? Yes. What's the difference between what's happening on page <coughs> nine, right? Page, page, page eight. Page eight. Line 16. But I think what's happening on, on line 16 of page 8 yeah. and the whole next page is it's giving um, uh, some guidance as to what they're looking for when they're looking through statutes or they're looking through, um, they look at rules and policies, what they're trying to achieve here. So if you go on to page, the next page, there are ABC, all these criteria basically <laughs> to use for their, uh, their evaluation and recommendation. And we don't even have a date on this report. The, the, sorry, the, the date is coming. It's in that section you referred to. Thank you. So this is a more substantive, like, what we have to consider, and then the details of the reporting come later, in terms of <coughs> timing and... So this talks about what it's supposed to include in the report, and then what it's supposed to be done. I'm a little tangled. Anybody else? <laughs> so we're talking about two reports then? There are actually three reports. Yeah. So if you go, maybe we should just skip ahead for a second and go back because go to, go to page 9, line 19, and that's the <coughs> reporting subsection. So you have three different reports due on three different dates. And this takes you through the timing and what has to be in the reports. March, December, and September, and this is when statutory changes under subdivision So this one that's due in March 2020 is just telling us how they form. Yeah, so who, who's on the working group? Yeah. Uh, it's work plans. It's basically a kind of a status report. Yeah, status report. Uh, more about the plan. Yeah. And then on line 10, the second report is on December 15th, 2020. That's more substantive. It has, again, the working group members, but now it's talking about recommended steps for changes um, and recommendations for training and preparations. Uh, and then the third report is a year, uh, two years later, sorry, uh, July 1, 2022. And again, uh, that's any further steps for changes they recommend. And again, recommendations for training and preparations. So this could include Could include requests for funding. In a sense. So we want to provide this training to schools. Yeah. Training and appropriation, yeah. So that takes us back to page eight. Relationship of yeah, I'm confused. Uh, page eight and nine. <clears throat> yep. Dylan. Yes. <clears throat> so let's see here. 
if we jump back real quick, page seven, top of the page, we have the duties of the working group, which says what it's going to do at the end of its time in existence. Those provisions follow. Then on eight, it's spelling out what it can do to achieve the goals that were just described on the previous page. So it's, it's, re its review will lead to that final report, the final recommendations. It page eight describes the scope of review. It walks us through there. So the scope of review involves it applies to the, statute, the statute, rule, and district policy. Right. right. And so then if you look, it's clarified, though. As you go down, it says when those reports are happening. And so then it lays out the reports. So there's three reports. This is spelling out what it does. You know, so this is interesting. You had asked earlier, uh, Representative Elder indicated that on the top of page eight, there was some discussion about what that should say. And he brought up state board rules. Um, part of the impetus for that discussion, which I had with um, an individual knowledgeable with education law, was that it should be consistent throughout the document. And so, you know, I, I think that's just something we need to flag. Where the reference is later around state board rules, it's to me what that is doing is clarifying what what this group is going to look at. And by uh, by saying that they may review it, you you are setting up the possibilities <coughs> for their analysis, which will inform the findings of their report, which we will be receiving bits of throughout their life essentially. So I, I mean, my only concern, and this is like a Scribner's question, right? This is the, the yeah. legal drafting question is, are, are we consistently, is the scope consistently delineated throughout the process? And as long as it is, and as long as our attorney can tell us with certainty it is, it's sort of that Scribner's question. It might need to be clarified at some later stage of this, but I think it's clear what we're asking them to look at and when they're going to report <coughs> to us their findings. I think the disconnect in this draft is that Line one on page, on page eight talks about yep. they may review their stuff. Don't have to, they may. Um, and line 16 talks about what they're reporting. I think they should be synced up. So I think they should, if you're going to synced this up, I think you could say may review all existing state statutes, state board rules, school district policies relating to standards and curriculum. So limit to that topic. So they referenced uh, twice. And then, and then they'll be reporting on those things. Um, so that makes more sense to me in terms of consistency. I'm really glad that we're keeping the word may. Yes. Right. Are we okay with uh, saying school district policy? Is that diving a little deep? Well, it's reporting back to us. Right. Okay. What's happening with school district policy? And, and sort of along that same line as we move into page nine, and again, this is you know, there's nothing, nobody's making anybody do anything here, but we are getting into areas like um, uh, established disciplinary response on, on 14, whether we establish dis disciplinary responses to racial or ethnic and social group incidents that include the utilization of restorative practices where appropriate. Um, just a little, that level of specificity in comparison to kind of how non-specific a lot of the rest of it is, I'm a little confused by. <clears throat> Who can speak to that? It does, I will say, um, co-sponsoring this bill, uh, that would appear to be in the wheelhouse of school district policy. When you say school district policy, we say is this a state school district policy? Because each, so they're going to look at every district's policy, school district policy? Uh, that would be for the working group to determine through their scope of work. Because th we're giving them the permission to say, hey, we, we recognize this is an area that impacts the work and the goals that we're trying to accomplish. So you may mm -hmm. look there should you have you the time. Okay. Right. So you may go to your school, look at policy, yep. and go, whoa, this yep. looks troublesome. And then you go to your school, and you go, oh, I have a problem here. Mm -hmm. 
So it would, we would be interested in hearing yep. if that's showing up in school policy. Yeah, I like the May. Particularly when it relates to things like gender identification. Yep. Well, that one right up, doesn't it? That's a lot. I was confused. That was a lot. I do want to just point out on, on uh, line 9, uh, page 9, line 8, that the ability-based bias that the uh, that we wanted to change it to ableist bias. Yes. Is there a word there? Right here. Where it says ability based, <coughs> oh. the, the current language is ableist. Ableist? Based. Mm. And or just ableist. Based. No, ableist. based or biased. Ableist. Ableist, ableist biased, mm. excuse me, yes. <coughs> Take out bias too. Yeah. Mm. Okay. A ableist, no. Right no, it has to have bias. Ableist is to racist. Right. That's kind of where I am. Oh, okay, right. Racist, sexist, gender, or ableist, or bias based on. So, ability based bias becomes ableist. So, line 17, where it says all. What page? Um, Page nine. Yeah. Ensure that the school provides all its personnel training in how to best address by. Should we strike all? I mean, it, it looks like they're, they're designating all. All. I'm not. You know, I thought it could say ensure that school the school provides personal training in how to best address bias incidents, but. I agree with that. Yes. That might be a little beyond what they can do. Yeah. <laughs> this little unpaid group. But we're still under the may do all this yes. <laughs> yeah. category. So then we're down to reports, is that right? On mm -hmm. page nine? publish it. Yeah, and just, it, to, it, I don't want to confuse anyone more here, but if you look at page 8, this might be important. Um, there is a shall with this part, but it's what you're including in the report. Page 8, line 16, this is about the report itself. You are, you are, inc you are reviewing these areas, but you're doing it through the lens of what follows on page 9. And so looking at things <coughs> like a personnel training question would just be within the scope of, of review that you might look at as you try to compile your report. And so I just, that's sort of a, it's a word backflip for everyone to understand, but well, and I feel very up, comfortable. Well, you bring up a good point, though. Uh, just in terms of that says shall, and that's basically required, requiring the working group to take in, take in all of ABC that follows it, and they might look at that and say, that's just overwhelming. You have to include all of it or none of it. Well, the shall, though, is I think you're looking at the shall on line 16, right? I'm yeah. Afraid. So it says shall, and then it says that it has identified as needing. Yep. So oh, sorry. It's, right. a, it's a yep. May 1st yep. in terms of what they yep. have to. Yep. So I think that's. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Well, that's the first thing that I wanted to point out. Are we up to page 11? <clears throat> okay, do this at the State Board of Education. Oh, if we get there, oh, okay. sure. uh, if we can look at, on, on uh, page 10, yeah. uh, line, line 10, this is the second report of the committee. So it's going to, on line 13, recommend statutory changes. I think because now it's going to be um, looking at State Board rules and policies. I wouldn't say recommend changes because that's really beyond mm -hmm. your scope, but maybe it's observations uh, on its findings in, in those two areas. Okay. 
Okay. If you did that there, you could also do it in the next section mm -hmm. of the third report as well. So they would be reporting findings <coughs> as opposed to recommending changes? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I like that. And that is the, that is the same function because ultimately the state board or state policy makers here would need to make changes in order to adopt it. Right. Well, let's see, so that's the membership, report findings, recommendations for training? It's the before. So membership, set short changes, training and appropriations, and their findings, that's the policies and rules. <clears throat> this actually is interesting because um, we spent a lot of time, I think, thinking about how do we how do we push this down? You know, once the work is done, what are policymakers going to have to do to ensure that this happens, right? And we have a local control education system. So what we've heard in testimony is that training and education or training may be needed. I'm guessing it will be needed and an appropriation at some point may be needed to ensure this happens. For instance, right. if you were to have implicit bias training at all Vermont schools, clearly that would carry a cost. But it's for, once we're confronted with the information provided by this working group, it would be for those policymakers to determine what the appropriate way to address those needs were. And so their recommend, the working group's <coughs> recommendation would be extremely important to guiding that work. Distracted, so I understand what you're saying. I think it, it definitely makes sense because they may say we think you should set up a grant program and have schools apply for a training money. You should be providing. What did she say? This was a, a great one. Come up with a self-evaluation tool for, for SU's uh, mm -hmm. SU curriculum coordinators to evaluate curriculum. Yeah. I kind of fell in love with that one, quite frankly. You may bring it up to the working group as they're going through their process. That's really getting on the ground. That can come from your training appropriations. All right, what line are we up to? I think you're on duties on page 11, line right. 3. Right. Exactly what they do. I thought it was because they're required to do that standard. Uh, so. do no, I thought right. that's why they were opposed to the standard curriculum. Also, let's see where the part says statewide curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just trying to process what we've heard. I, I imagine we would strike out curriculum here. Just it would just say uh, consider adopting ethnic and social equity studies standards. Yeah. Right. I would. Again, cross reference the statute under which right. they're required to do that. Okay. And it yeah. seemed like that's what uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher said earlier. Yeah. This is, it's, it seems clunky, I think, was essentially what she said in paraphrase, but that's the way the system works. That's right. what I got. Yeah. There's, there is no statewide curriculum standards. Right. There are just standards. There are no statewide curriculum standards. <laughs> Then um, Rev. Elder had the point that the first sentence and the second sentence in this paragraph don't work together very well. Where, um, where are you? I'm sorry. sorry uh, same section here. Um, so the first sentence talks about um, shall consider, yeah. and the second sentence talks about um, uh, will consider the report when determining the standards to adopt, as if it's a direction to adopt something. Right, so then the imperative at the end. Yeah. So I think I think this should can be changed to connect those two sentences and just say um, 
state board shall um, consider adopting standards taking into account the report submitted by the working group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have your name all over this document, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then the general powers and duties. That's everything we've been through so far, exceptional law. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is all temporary, a couple of years long. Mm -hmm. Next section, section two, is amending our uh, statute and yeah. the green books. So this would be would be the green books. So this will allow us to get a statewide report, but not necessarily a district district comparison report. They're able to gather that data; they just can't report that. Yeah, the school, on, on the school with sixteen yeah, students. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that to, just to go back to the old terminology thing, it's probably SUs are big enough that you can report an SU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and the current law says school by school. We're amending that. Right. Each, to, right. That's we're pulling back. Language. Right. Yeah. We're pulling back a little bit. Yeah. That debate on passage. Jim, can you um, do a, a stack-off okay, yeah. on this? Sure. Um, and let's, are, are people feeling pretty good that it's possible this afternoon we're going to be able to vote? Could, yeah. Could, uh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. could you just explain why it was meant by doing a strike-off? And why this basically, um, doing the strike-off makes it much easier to report on the floor for starters. If we do, if we're, if we just amend something, then this is the, this goes, this goes on the, on the, um, the calendar, and then we have just the section that we're, we are amending. By doing the strike all, we're putting in all the language we just did, and we're keeping it in a, one clean document that doesn't have everybody going back and forth trying to figure out what we changed. Mm -hmm. This is always available to everybody, but the new one will be what we actually pass. Just cleaner, since we're making changes all over the place. Can I bring it back to the beginning, which is the yeah. Penn schools? Um, yeah. So in that section, we talked about the duties of the state board. Um, uh, I'm not sure if we decided to, well, it says uh, for students in pre-K through 12, so it's ambiguous as to whether it's only for public schools or for independent schools. Or, that's, uh, that's, still a, that's still a piece we haven't sorted out yet. Um, Okay. Um, and it says leave that the um, statutory requirements of the state board to adapt standards for public schools. Okay. I think they only apply to an independent school if it if the school meets education quality standards. Um, I think only one school in the state does that, which is Bedford. Um, so I think I think basically this is a basically a public school requirement in terms of adopting standards. <coughs> I think um, if I reference the statutes I've mentioned a few times, it would be implicitly saying it's for public schools. Yeah. Make sure you're saying don't go there. Yeah, is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm not saying don't go there. I'm just saying how it's constructed. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So she will be the public Willing schools the only. And that leaves the act title appropriate. Uh, the act yeah. title on page one is yeah. stands for public schools. Let's, let's go with that draft. Sure. We might have draft threes, but right now we're doing draft two. I don't think we're going to have draft 18. Nor will it grow in pages. Well, this is also a small one. So when do we come back? Is it after the governor's? We'll come back after the governor's draft.